Uh, we can resume our hearing. We have two more agenda items this afternoon. Um, we have cost share reduction policy update, and we have a potential vote noticed. And then after that, we'll have the uh, monthly ahead model and global payment development update. And I'm not sure how long we'll go today, but we're scheduled to go till five. Um, and so I'll turn it to Mike Barber uh, on the cost share reduction policy update. Um, I'm not sure if board members have any questions or comments, um, but Mike, did you have anything to add at this point? Um, I did want to add uh, that we didn't receive any additional public comment um, besides the, the comment that um, Mr. Fisher gave at the meeting last week. Um, and I, I previously shared with you all the, the feedback we got from the carriers, um, which is kind of what prompted us to present two options for your consideration. So, um, and then Mr. Fisher had a, a question that he posed um, last week, and I think Kevin, if he's on the line, is able to answer that. Um, are you on, Kevin? I am, yes. Um, there are some question marks and, and things where we'd be able to hopefully tighten things up a little more, but it, we, we believe that the initial proposed guidance would probably increase the APTC by about 15 to 25 million, and that the revised proposed guidance would um, increase APTC by about 35 to 45 million, both of those relative to the status quo. So, some some error bars around it, but 20 for one option and 40 for the other. And that's all the, the new information I think we had to to give you. Um, we'd be happy to pull up the slides from last week and um, try to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, would you pull up that slide 11 to kind of <clears throat> Orient the board members, and then we can have any discussion or questions that they may have. Yes, just give me one second. So, um, Showing for you all. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um. I'll open up to the board members for questions or comments or, or thoughts they may have on these various approaches. I'll jump in. Um, so Mike, um, I know we last week we went through sort of the differences between the two proposals. It seems like the crux of the matter is the en enrollment assumption. Um, and if I'm remembering, I, I know it was just last week, but it feels like it's like a month ago. <laughs> so my apologies for not being crystal clear anymore. Uh, but I think the other states that have implemented are in the revised proposed guidance type area in terms of the enrollment assumptions, or am I remembering that wrong? That's that's accurate. I, I think you're referring to New Mexico and Texas, and while there are yes. some nuanced differences between them, they are roughly in the, the camp of the revised That's what I thought I had remembered.
Any other thoughts from board members? And <clears throat> if not, are we prepared to vote? I, I think we forget to forget if we have to vote today. Um, Mike, can you remind me? Do we need to vote by today? Um, that was the hope. Uh, there's no there's no deadline to this. Obviously, we want to get. Um, I think both of these approaches would require us to get some information and then issue like, calculate a load that both carriers would have to use in their filings, which are due kind of beginning of May. So uh, we were hoping to get moving on that, but there's no there's no deadline. Yes. The only question I would have is. I mean, the opportunity to bring in $40 million of additional federal subsidy to make health insurance more affordable for voters is incredible. Um, and, you know, the potential downside seems to be this, you know, this, the um, enrollment assumptions and assuming that people are acting, quote, you know, rationally in the economic sense of the term and, and uh, purchasing plans that are as financial interest for themselves, but are there, am I missing something else? Is there another potential risk of doing this that, that you all have thought of? I mean, I, I'll kick it over to Jackie and Kevin if they have any comments, but I think they, they covered last week some concerns about um, just distorting the market um, and, yeah. and introducing some risk there in the event that one carrier picks up a, um, you know, a, a substantial portion of the people in these silver plans. Um, there's also the possibility that the enhanced premium tax credits um, go away after 2025, which I think, and I'll look to Jackie and Kevin to correct me if I'm wrong, reduces the the benefits a little bit and also kind of increases that group of folks who could potentially be harmed by this depending on what plan they choose um, because they don't get the premium tax credits. Um, and then the other kind of potential downside I see is, and it's, it, it honestly, it's nothing compared to <laughs> probably the upside that you mentioned, but um, it just makes us less comparable, I think, to other states, which I know you have brought up to me a couple times, like in addition to strict community rating or pure community rating, this will just be another thing that we have to like keep in mind when we're looking at how our rates compare to others when, you know, Kaiser Family Foundation puts out their, their numbers every year that everybody looks at. Um, that's, I don't know, Kev, Kevin or Jackie, do you have any additional thoughts? Not on my side. I think you covered, I, I was going to say some of the things you were going to say. So, Yeah, I, I would, I guess, just mention, so, you know, as you talk about uh, destabilizing the market, one way of talking about it, right, is the concern is what if that 40 million all goes to one carrier or the other? Um, and I, it's not just a concern about harm to the carriers, given that this market is dependent on voluntary participation by the carriers. So worst case scenario there would be potentially real harm to the members if carriers, one or both, were to leave the market. Um, I, I, again, I'm not trying to suggest that's going to happen. Uh, you've you've read the carrier's feedback on this, but that's that's why we raise that as a concern. And then I think it's it's present for both both versions of the the guidance amendment that you're considering, but those actuarial kind of objections that we discussed last year in relation to this issue this issue are still there. I don't think anything's really changed on that front. On the APTC and 
uh, ARPA stuff. I mean, it seems to is there a downside if we if we did decide to go with the revised proposed guidance and then in 2026 the ARPA subsidies go away? I mean, we could change the guidance for 20 reconsider it in that light, right? Is there a a downside to that that I'm missing? Or something I'm not thinking about. Like it seems fixable in that circumstance or recon like a reconsiderable. Sure. I I don't see any reason why you couldn't adjust it if that expansion goes away. Well, I'll just say for myself, I think I'm comfortable with. Um, I think we definitely need to revise the guidance so that it's clearer and we don't have the issue that we had last time. Um, I can be comfortable with the revised proposed guidance, but I'm also, um, you know, I could be convinced that taking a more modest step with the initial proposed guidance is. Uh, the better way to go. So I feel uh, pretty flexible on which of the two. Um, so I'll, I, that may not help other people decide, but <laughs> I'll just throw it out there that that's kind of where I am right now. So I'll chime in that I feel um, identical to to member lunch. Um, I'm comfortable with the revised proposed guidance. I think the benefits and the upside are substantial. The risks can be mitigated if need be later. And uh, I am curious to hear if there's any public comment on this um, or if the carriers have anything additional to, to shed light on. Um, but, but that's where I am. I guess I'll just say that I'm um, I'm leaning towards the revised proposed guidance for the reasons you know outlined in terms of the um, potential to draw down more federal dollars uh, for Vermonters. But um, again, if there's public comment and if something we haven't considered, I'm interested in hearing that. I'd always be interested in more information, but at the moment I'm in favor of the revised proposal. Would it make sense for me to make a motion and then we can move it to public comment, Owen? I think so. Okay, then I move uh, that we approve the revised proposed guidance and delegate authority to uh, Mike Barber to uh, work with the actuaries to do the requisite calculations and compose the guidance document. I'll second the motion. Um, and with that, I'll open up to public comment. Um, we can go to the HCA first. Good afternoon, all. I think my comment won't surprise you one bit. I. Um... Uh, as I said last week, I think this is a, um, a substantial gain. I think the pros far outweigh the gain, the, the potential cons, and I think it's been covered pretty well, sort of your options to mitigate those possible cons should they arise. Um, so I um, fully support and think it's a good thing for Vermonters for you to go to the revised guidance. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. <clears throat> um, any other public comment via the raise the hand function? Uh, 
I'm going to observe that this is a very eerie day and that we have had three presentations and not a single public comment. <laughs> this is maybe it's a first. Um, well, on that event, uh, I will call for a vote. Um, all those board members in favor of moving to the revised proposed guidance and delegating to Mike Barber, uh, the drafting of that, uh, please say aye. 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 The vote is unanimous. All right, thank you. I'll share a thank you, Mike. Revised. Um, I'll share the guidance when it's when it's ready. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, and our last agenda item for today is the monthly ahead model and global payment development update. And I'll turn to Michelle Degree, who has been taking uh, the laboring or for the care board, and she is our health policy project director. And we also have um, our frequent guest, Pat Jones, the interim director of health care reform from the Agency of Human Services. And I believe um, one of our care board consultants, Shule Garovich from uh, Mathematica Policy Research is with us as well. So I'll turn to Ms. Degree and uh, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Are you all able to see that? We are. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I'll be running slides. So Pat, as per usual, just let me know when you'd like me to advance, though I've seen them, so I could probably do it myself now. <laughs> um, I will also start out by saying we didn't prepare a slide for this, but Pat and I wanted to highlight that um, there is our currently <laughs> final global budget tag meeting scheduled for next Thursday, February 29th, which is a leap day. Um, and at that meeting, um, we will be reviewing and discussing the differences between the states, sort of the tags uh, work to date on the state defined methodology and what we recently learned um, last week from CMMI, CMS on their um, Medicare methodology as it relates to global payment for the AHEAD model, um, not something we had time to prepare for today, but is something that we'll be discussing with that group next week. And then um, we'll likely bring that back to the board at a future date, um, but wanted to flag that those materials are available on the AHEAD website for folks who might be interested in seeing sort of what the, the, the CMS methodology sort of looks like. It's 186 pages, so Godspeed, uh, but um, just wanted to, to share that with you all. Um, so for today, uh, again, as with last uh, month, we're going to do a quick review of executive session from me, and then I will turn it over to Pat to do sort of a, a revisit of the AHEAD model itself, quick background and overview of sort of where we are, an overview of those model timelines. And then today we're going to focus a little deeper on primary care ahead, which is something we haven't done um, in too much detail with the board yet. Um, Pat will be leading, but I am here to assist as needed. Um, and then we'll go into questions and um, comment. And of course, we've reserved time for executive session today. Should any of the questions kind of go into the negotiation space? So with that executive session on the screen, uh, you all are pretty familiar with this, but just a, a flag. There are grounds for holding executive session. Um, we will need a motion to do so in the event that we decide to move to executive session uh, and a vote. Uh, for two thirds of you to say yes, let's let's move, uh, and then we'll sort of. I believe typically we pop back on to close the meeting, Chair Foster. But um, I just want to flag that that this is a potential for today, not a guarantee. But in the event that we need to, you have seen the rules. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Jones. Well, thank you, Chair Foster and members of the board. 
My name is Pat Jones. I'm Interim Director of Healthcare Reform for the Agency of Human Services. I'm going to warn you that my internet um, appears to be a little bit spotty. Um, so if you need me to repeat anything um, that I'm saying, please um, let me know. Uh, and it's, it's the audio mainly. So what I wanted to do today was, as Michelle said, do um, some we are in a conversation. And then um, my understanding was that the board um, wanted uh, more detail on the timelines for the AHEAD model, both in terms of preparing an application and if Vermont is selected. ends up moving forward with the model. So I'll um, provide a bit of information on that. And then really the bulk of the presentation will be devoted to a deeper dive on primary care ahead as Michelle indicated. So um, next slide and the next one. So um, one of the things I've been doing lately in um, presentations is just, you know, it's good to remind ourselves, I think, of what we're trying to do here. What are our goals um, in healthcare reform? And so at the highest level, healthcare reform really is looking to use public policy to address challenges in the healthcare system. And this board certainly um, hears about the challenges daily in your work. Uh, but just to highlight um, some of them, um, we, you know, certainly ensuring affordability is a challenge and a key goal, uh, improving access not only to care, but to insurance coverage as well. Uh, optimizing quality of healthcare, and that includes a person's experience of care as they access the healthcare system, improving the health of the entire population, uh, improving equity and reducing disparity. Health the ahead model. Identifying social determinants of health or what um, CMS is calling health-related social needs and determining how to address those. Ensuring uh, adequate workforce ac across all of our care settings. Uh, reducing complexity, and that includes a uh, burden for providers, um, areas where uh, different payers may be misaligned. So what are some ways that we can reduce complexity? And then creating a sustainable health care system. I'm sure there are others, but um, those are the challenges that we hear the most about and that have really risen to the fore. And so it's an ambitious undertaking, but that's the goal. That's what we're trying to do here. And, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about payment reform, and that is one very key component of healthcare reform. But, um, you know, keeping in mind that it's really a means to an end, um, the goal is that the payment changes that we make would actually um, support care delivery transformation and that the end result would be better health outcomes for Vermonters and improved population health. So just wanted to um, take a minute to um, level set there. Next slide. So why, um, why are we considering a new federal model? Um, as everyone here knows, we have a current model with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, um, and the really key element of that is that it's an arrangement between Vermont and the federal government that allows Medicare in particular um, to pay for health care differently and also Medicaid and our commercial insurers as well. And the current model really lays out some state level accountability around um, reducing growth in health care costs, improving the health of Vermonters, and maintaining or improving quality on key um, measures. It shifts, it has helped us shift from paying for um, each service in a volume based fashion, fee for service 
um, to more predictable and prospective um, payments that are linked to quality. And as everyone knows, it does rely on an accountable care organization in um, Vermont, our um, ACO that uh, implements this model is One Care Vermont, um, and the ACO and the providers that participate in the ACO have agreed um, that they'll be accountable for care, cost, and quality on behalf of the folks that they serve. The original performance period for the model was 2018 through 2022, so five performance years. Um, we are currently in the second year of a two-year extension period. So the model is set to end on December 31st of this year. Um, CMS is uh, quite interested in 2025. Um, they see it as a potential bridge um, for future um, engagement with Vermont. And so, you know, really um, what a new, you know, our current model will be ending. Um, and what a new federal model would do is allow us to continue our healthcare reform efforts with Medicare involvement. Without a new model, um, Medicare would not um, continue to be involved. And I'll go into a little more detail in a couple slides on what um, some of the benefits of the head model in particular might be. Um, so next slide. Just some background on how this all came about. Um, you know, we had been talking, and, and other states as well, with CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is a, an arm of CMS. Um, we have been talking about, um, you know, potential future models. Um, they, um, you know, on September 5th, they made a formal announcement about the AHEAD model, which stands for states advancing all payer health equity approaches and development. And then on November 16th, a couple months later, they released this notice of funding opportunity for the AHEAD model, um, which is really a call for applications. Um, and so they invited state, any state and sub-state region, so it doesn't have to be a whole state, um, to apply for the model. The focus of the NOFO really is um, they want to hear about what are states, you know, states that apply, what are their capacity to implement a model um, like this? And then there is um, an offer of up to $12 million over the first five to six years of the model. Um, how would state, they, they call that cooperative agreement funding, how would the states actually use that funding to support um, standing up the model? So that's really the focus of the um, application and the notice of funding opportunity. A link to the website here, lots of um, material, they keep adding to it on their website about the model. A uh, key date, um, the applications for cohort one and cohort two states, there's up to three cohorts. Um, the applications for those first two to, to first states are due on March 18th. Um, the third cohort has until August um, to submit applications. It's a competitive process. So CMMI is going to select only eight states or um, sub-state regions. And, um, you know, there does seem to be quite a bit of interest um, nationally. Um, it's, it's not yet certain how many will apply and how many will apply for the various cohorts, but um, there certainly is a lot of interest. Uh, I want to really emphasize yep. um, yep. what the application is. Um, the application is really the first step um, toward potential state participation. So it's the start of, you know, a more formal engagement with CMS. Um, there's no guarantee that um, Vermont or any other state will be selected for participation in the model, and there would be um, need to be some time to negotiate an agreement um, 
you know, in some terms with CMMI and CMS, um, then it would be, you know, time to think about moving forward. But really think of this as a first step. Next slide. So you've seen this before. Um, this is a CMS slide, but it really does do a decent job of showing um, the head model at a glance. And um, so there's sort of three layers here. The first is um, what they call statewide accountability targets. And there are three areas um, where they um, intend, you know, similar to our current model where we have areas of statewide accountability, they plan to um, hold states accountable for, first of all, total cost of care growth. So that speaks to that um, cost containment and affordability um, area. And they will look at both Medicare. Um, and when they say Medicare, they mean fee, traditional fee-for-service Medicare, uh, not Medicare Advantage. So how are we doing in Medicare and how are states doing in all payer total cost of care growth? Second area, and this will be one that um, I'll dive into in more depth today, is um, primary care investment. Uh, they intend to in primary care. You see that as key for model success. And again, they'll be looking at that on a Medicare and all payer basis. And then there will be um, equity and you know population health measures in the state agreements. Um, and they'll um, expect states to set targets in that area as well. And for that. Um, so you know, the model is of longer duration than what we've seen in the past. Um, it, it seems that CMMI has learned that it does, for these types of large trans transformations, it takes time. So we're talking about models that are eight or nine years in duration, depending on which cohort a state is in. So for the accountability target show, we currently have some familiarity with, like I said, with total cost of care growth, um, quality, um, population health type targets. The primary care investment is, is new, um, but it's an area that this board has certainly um, done some work in. And uh, Michelle Degree in particular has led that um, work. And then, um, you know, equity, that focus on equity is an important component of the model as well. So that's the statewide accountability targets. The three components that CMS highlights first, um, the cooperative agreement funding that I mentioned before, um, you know, not a tremendous amount of money, but up to $12 million for um, spread out over five and a half um, years or so. Um, and so that's, you know, to really help states, um, in, you know, implement this model. And then um, hospital. of the model, and you've heard um, a lot about that in the past, and we'll continue Ms. to hear about Ms. that. Ms. Jones, I'm going to yeah. let her up for a second. You're going a little bit in and out. Um, it's it might you do you want to try it without the video just to see if it smooths it out a little bit? Sure, sure. My apologies. Oh, it's okay. Let, let me know if that works better without the video. Um, it it does yeah let's try that okay. sorry okay okay no Thank my you. apologies i i knew things appeared to be a little shaky so um so then in terms of you know how so the, those are the components but how does cms really anticipate that we will um, be able to achieve the goals of the model and that's what these strategies really relate to so um First of all, integrating equity across the model. Um, you'll see it in various components of the model. Second, um, they really see integration of mental health and substance use disorder treatment as being um, you know, a key strategy 
the uh, results. They call it an all-payer approach. Um, they're really talking about, you know, at least multi-payer. So a big focus on um, Medicaid participation and a big um, focus in uh, sort of the set starting in the second year of the model on bringing um, at least one commercial payer into the model and hopefully more. And then alignment um, across payers, but particularly they Medicaid, and um, you'll see that both in the global budget expectations for Medicaid, and you'll definitely see it in the primary care uh, component of AHEAD, and I'll talk about that in greater detail in a moment. And then finally, um, they have said that, you know, what they intend to do is accelerate existing state innovations. Um, we think in the AHEAD model, as we examine it, that it definitely does help um, acceler accelerate some of our existing innovations. There's some other areas, um, you know, particularly around primary care capitation models where, um, it, um, you know, they're, they're not quite where we might be um, in Vermont, but there's definitely a, a hope that there would be acceleration there. How's the audio? Is it better? Yeah, significantly better. Okay, good. Then I'll just, uh, I believe me, I don't mind being off camera, so I will happily keep my video off. Thank you. <laughs> okay, next slide. So um, I had said a couple slides ago that I would, um, you know, provide a little more information about, you know, what are the benefits of um, continuing to include Medicare and Vermont healthcare reform, and particularly thinking about this model. And this this slide's a bit of a work in progress. Um, keep adding to it a bit, but. Um, sort of that first row of um, benefits really speak to um, reimbursement levels. Um, so, you know, one thing about participating in these types of models is that um, it, as opposed to a care fee for service reimbursement is for providers, it does give us some ability to influence that. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, Vermont um, is a, has, for a while has been a low cost state um, for Medicare. And so um, a model like this can um, continue to recognize that. In the notice of funding opportunity, um, CMS definitely indicated that, um, you know, the expectations for high cost states would be. Um, different than for lower cost states. So there's some recognition there that there's, you know, less, there could be less room to improve. Um, and then um, it, you know, we have a, a number of reforms. That we, we have a long history of engaging with Medicare, with CM. Example, the support and services at home um, program is an example. And um, also, you know, our current all payer model, all of those, um, all of those models have shown, um, you know, reductions in Medicare costs over what would be expected. And so, um, you know, continuing to participate with CMS can help make sure that those savings are recognized and potentially built into the model. So that's um, sort of the first row. The second row um, really um, speak on and into the third row really speaks to some of the dollars that could be coming into the state um, as a result of um, the AHEAD model and continued participation with Medicare. Um, the first one, as I mentioned, is that up to $12 million in cooperative agreement funding. Um, second, the uh, Medicare currently continues to um, provide funding for a portion, its portion of the blueprint um, payments, and um, specifically for practices um, 
uh, primary care practices and for community health teams and for that SASH program. We get, as you know, because you've um, worked with it in your um, ACO budget efforts, we get between nine to ten million dollars um, annually um, for from Medicare. It goes through the ACO, but then it goes out to um, primary care practices and SASH and community health teams. Without, uh, you can't see me shaking my head no, but without um, Medicare, care involvement in uh, lose that that funding and it's really particularly significant for sash because it's you know essentially the bulk of their budget and then um you know i'll talk about this a bit more uh in a moment too but um a way that medicare is saying you know they're saying we want to see increased investment in primary care and they're actually putting their money where their mouth is um they're offering enhanced payments to primary care practices and if my math is right it could approach um 17 million dollars annually if all of vermont's primary care practices decide to participate in the ahead model so just keep in mind that's if they all did and then um, in addition there's um, transformation funding that cms has said that they would offer hospitals um, that decide to participate during the initial couple years of the model. Um, so that would um, infuse some additional funding. And um, there's a chance for upside funding based on performance on equity um, targets and measures, and then um, some quality adjustments as well. And then finally, um, sort of a couple of, you know, what I put into the care delivery um, benefits um, area. Um, one is that, you know, when we get the major payers rowing in the same direction and participating in these models together, it does um, support greater alignment and priorities and payment mechanisms and models in quality measures and reporting and all of that um, sends a stronger signal to the healthcare system and hopefully um, helps alleviate some provider burden and then um, the it, part of participating in these models as well is that Medicare does um, sometimes waive certain Medicare regulations and give states the ability to propose um, some of those waivers so it can improve um, care delivery on the ground. And one example um, that we have in our current model is that um, the requirement that there be a three-day stay in a hospital um, before a Medicare beneficiary can be um, admitted to a skilled nursing facility, um, that three-day stay is waived. Um, in the current model. And so that type of thing can make a, a big difference in how care is actually provided out in our communities. So that's, um, you know, that's just, a, um, a, you know, a, to um, continuing to have Medicare at the table. How am I doing audio wise? Uh, I'm seeing iffy. Uh no, no, I, I was just messing around with you. <laughs> okay. okay, still, still okay. All right, you're great. You're, you're doing great, Pat. Okay, I can't hear you, but I'm assuming you can still hear me. Oh. So, all right, you, you, um, we can hear you. Great, you're totally fine. Okay, perfect. All right, great. Okay, so um, let's dive a bit, because I know you had some interest in timelines. Let's dig into that a little bit. So next slide. Um, this shows the key dates um, for those states that um, participate in cohort one, and we are intending to apply as a cohort one state. Um, the difference It is the same, but cohort two wouldn't start until January of 2027. And then cohort three also would start in January, 
January of 2027, they would just have a little longer to put their application in. So um, as I know before, March 18th, right around the corner is the um, due date for applications from those cohort one and two states. Um, CMS is saying that in the May to June timeframe, they will um, notify um, which states they have selected um, to move forward with discussions about the AHEAD model. Then there is a pre, what they call a pre-implementation period that basically extends from July 1st um, of 2024, and that cooperative agreement funding would presumably become available at about that time. And then that goes all the way through uh, December 31st of 2025. And then uh, the start of that, in, in the case of cohort one states, it would be a nine year performance period um, going all the way through uh, 2034. That would begin on January 1st of 2026. Next slide. This is a messy slide, um, and I'm going to try and break it down um, for folks. Um, it's it's a CMS slide, and it's what they call operational milestones, and it talks about all the different things that need to happen once um, a state has been selected. So this would be during that pre-implementation period extending into implementation. Um, we added the dates here um, to try and make it a little clearer as to what it would look like for a cohort one state. Um, and I've color coded them here because I've tried to break down these timelines and these milestones into something a little more digestible. Um, so I will do that on the next three slides, but I wanted you to see how um, CMS has laid this out in terms of what they see as the operational milestones. So let's go to the next slide and we'll um, see if we can make this a little more um, digestible. This is actually pre um, July, so this isn't on the prior slide, but again, it's um, sort of a timeline of how the model was developed, the announcement, the application process taking us through CMMI's selection of states. So um, again, we and other states were able to, you know, have some discussions about um, current and future models and what things might look like. And that occurred during 2022 and 2023. As I mentioned before, the um, model was announced in September of 23. The NOFO was released in November of 2023. Cohort one and two states um, have till March 18th to apply. And then um, the selection again will occur in May or June of 2024. So that's sort of pre-implementation pre um, for the model. So the next slide. This, um, what I tried to do here was sort of pull the milestones together that relate to negotiations, um, execution of an agreement between states and CMS, and then um, the setting of statewide targets and particularly what CMS is looking for states to do in target setting is to um, focus on the all payer total cost of care and primary care investment targets. So the key um, time, that's key uh, deadlines there. Um, if Vermont, and we've um, mentioned this in prior presentations, but Vermont is one of the states that if we're selected, when we look at hospital global budget methodology, we could either go with the CMS methodology, which Michelle referenced in her opening comments that was just released on Valentine's Day, the 182-page um, document. Um, we can either go with 
what CMS is saying they're going to use for the Medicare hospital global budget methodology, or states with regulatory powers like what the Green Mountain Care Board has can opt to do a Medicare hospital global budget methodology. And there could be, you know, some advantages there in terms of tailoring and so forth. And, um, you know, we've had a work group and um, others that have really focused on this. Um, so if that's, if a cohort one state decides that they want to do a state specific methodology, Maryland's another state that certainly could because they've done deep work on hospital global budgets that review um, by July 1st of this year because they generally need about 18 months to um, review approve get clearance and set up um, operations to pay differently so that's a tight time frame um, but we have done quite a bit of work there so July 1st of this year for that um, the negotiations of um, the state agreement uh, between uh, a state and CMS would occur from, you know, July of this year um, through about May of 2025. Um, you know, so about 10 months. They want to, they want to, you know, have that agreement routing and executed by July 1st of 2025. So that's why sort of the May deadline to have things um, wrapped up. As far as those investment um, at targets for primary care and total cost of care, those all payer targets. CMS is expecting um, states to um, either through executive order or statute um, or rule to establish a, at least a process for how those targets will be set. And that deadline is uh, October 1st of 2025. And then finalizing the actual targets and getting them into the state agreement, they anticipate that that would, you know, require an amendment to the state agreement with CMS and needs to be done by October 1st of 2026. So a little bit after the start of the first performance year for those cohort one states. So that's, um, that's you know, that set of, of, of areas, negotiations, execution of the agreement, and then setting the targets. Next slide. And then this um, really reflects key, um, what I'm calling key implementation milestones that were included on that um, messy slide. Um, so um, the first relates to hospital recruitment. Um, there's a requirement that in order for states to move forward with the AHEAD model, that they would have to have recruited hospitals to participate in Medicare global budgets that represent at least 10% of the Medicare fee-for-service, traditional Medicare net patient revenue um, and that those hospitals would have to be under global budgets. And um, there, you know, I, I have a key down there, but when they talk about Medicare fee for service MPR, they're talking about net patient revenue for hospital inpatient and outpatient services. So um, the deadline there is October 1st of 2025 to have a hospital in in anticipation of one or more hospitals representing 10% of that revenue um, to, to in advance of that first performance year. The second thing, um, I had mentioned that they really want to see Medicaid um, involved in uh, this model in a big way. And so um, they are requiring on the primary care side that there be a Medicaid primary care alternative payment model that's implemented um, prior to the start of that first performance year. And I will just note, and we'll emphasize this later, 
that the blueprint for health um, appears to squarely qualify as a Medicaid primary care alternative payment model, and that is, um, you know, extensively implemented here in Vermont. So that should be a, um, a, a, an easy lift for a state like Vermont. Third, Medicaid is expected to also have um, hospital global budgets um, as well. And so the deadline there um, is by the end of the first performance year. So December 31st of 2026, that there be a Medicaid hospital global budget. Um, because of the current model, we certainly have some experience in Medicaid with prospective, you know, all-inclusive population-based payments. So there's some, you know, good and some work done to, um, you know, have a, a, a pathway into global budgets. So, um, so that um, is a requirement as well, but not till the end of the first performance year. By January 1st of 2027, at least one commercial payer needs to participate in the model. Uh, you know, the bulk of its business, it could be a self-insured plan. Um, you know, there there are a number of ways to meet that requirement, but you know, it's it's a it's a lift um, to get commercial payer involvement. So January 1st of 2027 there. And then um, another hospital milestone is that while 10% um, of Medicare fee-for-service MPR would need to be under a global budget um, by October 1st of 2025, 28 in advance of the fourth performance year, um, at least 30, their hospital participation would have to be such that at least 30% of Medicare fee-for-service MPR would be under global budgets by that fourth performance year. So those are, you know, what CAMS highlights as their key implementation milestones. I'm hopeful that, um, you know, breaking the timelines into, um, you know, categories like this is somewhat informative to you all um, in terms of what would be ahead if we were to um, move forward with ahead. Next slide. So let's um let's move on now to primary care ahead, and I'll um do my best to um share um details not only about what it looks like in the CMS model, but also how it compares to um you know what we have now. Not that what we have now will continue, but it's at least informative to look at um, what's in place now. Some of it will continue. And then um, I want to do I do want to spend a few minutes just talking about some of the engagement that we've had um, around primary care with with uh, primary care providers. So next slide. This is a CMS slide. Actually, the next several are um, you know they're pretty good at showing what um, what they're after here with primary care ahead, um, but. You know, this slide, you know, really shows um, at a high level what the program components and goals are. Um, you know, they see this as a, you know, voluntary to primary care program. Um, it, you know, they're focused on advanced primary care. They want to, you know, they say align Medicare with state-led primary care efforts, and they really um, mean Medicaid there. Um, or multi-payer primary care efforts. Um, you know, they they do provide some guidance on what they would like to see or some examples of what they'd like to see in terms of care transformation um, and, you know, with a focus on care coordination, connecting uh, folks to community resources, um, improving quality, person-centered care and um, minimizing provider burden. So the goals of the program, I've you know mentioned several of these already, but certainly they wanna see an increase in investment in primary care. 
They want to see payers aligned um, as much as possible. Uh, they want to support advanced primary care, and I'll, um, you know, share a little more about that on the next slide. And in this model, they really are interested in seeing safety net providers participate both on the hospital side with critical access hospitals, but on the primary care side, they would like to see um, FQHCs, rural health clinics, and, um, you know, smaller independent practices participate in the model. The, the sort of the components, like how they intend to support achievement of these goals are first of all through, um, you know, support for care transformation activities. They're intending to provide enhanced payments to primary care providers for uh, Medicare beneficiaries. They um, also intend to provide learning collaboratives and supports, other mechanisms for, um, you know, supporting promising practices, and then data and technical assistance as well. So that's sort of how they see their role in supporting achievement of the program goals. Next slide. This just goes into a tad more detail on the goals themselves. Um, I've already talked about primary care investment, but just to get a little more granular about that, what they're talking about is increasing primary care investment statewide um, as a percentage of total cost of care. So um, numerator, primary care investment, denominator, total cost of care, what's the percentage set a target? Um, for increasing that percentage. And um, as Michelle and others can attest more than I can, those how, that sounds like a pretty easy math calculation, but how you define uh, primary care investment and total cost of care can, uh, it, it, there, there's, it, it presents some interesting questions and challenges. So, um, but you all have done some groundwork work on that, which is really helpful. Um, second, aligning payers. Um, so the way they describe this is they, they say, you know, this model brings Medicare to the table for state-led primary care transformation with a focus on Medicaid alignment. Um, you know, it's a little different than how they're talking about hospital global budgets. With hospital global budgets there, you know, as I, as we said on February 14th, they released this very detailed spec. Here, um, they really appear to be looking to Medicaid to take the lead on what um, that primary care transformation would look like, and they want to be supportive of, of that. And so again, with the work that's occurred um, with the blueprint, the current model, um, Vermont um, is, is um, you know, pretty in pretty good shape in terms of having a model. And part of that is to really support advanced primary care. And the way they describe that, and I'll, I have a slide in a moment that goes into some examples that they've identified, but it really is looking at, um, you know, improving mental health and substance use disorder integration um, in primary care. Um, care coordination and screening and addressing for health related. So those are the areas that they've really focused on in terms of advanced primary care. And then again, that broadening of participation to um, practice types that may not have had the opportunity to participate in prior models. One of the reasons I include this slide too is that peach colored bar at the bottom. Um, while um, the current include a capitated primary care model or track, um, they have said that they intend 
to introduce um, some form of um, capitation risk type model as an option for primary care in the future. And they've said maybe even as soon as 2027. And so that might be an opportunity where we, um, you know, for us to, um, you know, provide some insight given that um, under the current model, the ACO has worked with independent primary care practices on a capitated model. So that's something if we were to move forward with the Sorry. So um, just a couple of words from their website, really, on, on increasing primary care investment. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here. The first, um, and these are direct quotes, um, the AHEAD model is designed to increase Medicare fee-for-service investment in primary care and align primary care transformation with existing innovations in state Medicaid programs. So again, you know, a very clear state investment increases and they wanna see that alignment with Medicaid. And then they do say that for that all payer primary care um, investment target, um, that there is, they're gonna, Medicare is gonna calculate primary care investment, how they calculate it. But they're saying that for states, um, looking at the all payer um, targets and measurement, that there's flexibility for states to construct their own primary care definitions for spending measurement for all payer primary care investment targets. And so that's pretty important because I, as you know, um, currently in Vermont, we have um, a number of, you know, non-claims type payments. The um, ACO model, um, there's a lot of um, prospective non-claims type payments. independent practices and also hospital um, owned practices. There's the blueprint payments. Um, you know, there, there's a number of non-claims payments that, um, that we have that wouldn't be included if you were just looking at a claims-based measurement. So that's, that's an important um, aspect of the model. Um, next slide. I did want to share with folks, um, and I'll do this later on in terms of um, the primary care um, model itself, but I want to share at a high level what the application requirements are, just so you know um, what we have to provide to um, CMMI in our application. And so as it relates to statewide accountability and the primary care components of that, I've highlighted in red um, where we um, have to, you know, provide information. So the first is that, you know, they want to see, they want to know um, what state strategies are for measuring um, primary care investment across payers or, you know, they, again, they're going to do what they're going to do for Medicare, but they want to know, you know, what's our, um, what's our ability to measure um, and our strategy for measuring um, all payer primary care investment. So that's one um, component. Another is, um, how would we say, if you remember in the timeline, we have to have a process for um, setting primary care investment targets. So they want to know how are we going to do that? Are we going to use state executive order, statute, or regulation? Um, you know, how could we enforce um, the, the process and the setting of targets? So that's another area that we have to speak to in the application. Um, third, they want to know what is a state's ability to get information on primary care spending from commercial payers and Medicaid. Um, you know, fortunately, um, claims database, um, and so we have some information 
um, from commercial payers and we have the ability to, um, to gather Medicaid information as well. And then what are the policy levers that states can use to increase primary care spending um, by both commercial payers and by Medicaid? Um, I'll note that um, the, you know, one example of that is um, the blueprint statute that, um, that um, requires multi-payer participation in the blueprint. That's just one example. Um, and then finally, um, that last um, row, what are known gaps in primary care spending reporting? I mean, one important one is the, um, you know, the fact that B-Cures self-insured data in it. So, you know, that's a gap. I know your team has figured out ways to, um, estimate um, without some of that data. So that, you know, that's just an example of where there might be a gap in um, in reporting on spending. So those are the things I just wanted you to see, like what we have to, you know, answer to in the application. Next slide. So let's, um, let's I hope you're all hanging in with me. I know this is a lot of information. I also hope you can still hear me okay. If someone can give a thumbs up. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so I want to spend um, some time on really one of the key elements of primary care ahead, which is an enhanced primary care payment that Medicare is offering to practices that um, agree to participate in this model. So they are saying that, um, that they will provide participating practices with an average of $17 per Medicare fee for service member per month. Um, so for those Medicare folks that are attributed to the participating practices, and they've said they'll pay it quarterly, there, there you know, there's some adjustment to that based on um, social risk. So they're going to pay a little more for social risk. You know, if there's if the particularly vulnerable populations are being served in a practice, there's some quality adjustment. You know, so there's some adjustments there, um, but in no way would the payment be below fifteen dollars per beneficiary per month, and it would not exceed twenty one dollars per beneficiary per month. Um, so, you know, a pretty significant payment that they're talking about making here. A small portion of that payment, and they're talking about initially starting at 5% and then in the out years of the model scaling up to 10%, would be at risk for quality performance. Um, so, you know, I think it's 85 cents you know, initially, if, if it were a $17 payment, and then um, up to, you know, $1.70 um, toward the end of the model. Um, and I'll talk about what they are um, thinking in terms of quality measures in a, in a little bit. So that's the payment. Um, what's required um, for to uh, participate and receive that payment. Um, the practices would have to be participating in the state's patient-centered medical home or alternative payment model um, program. Again, for us, that's the blueprint and about 130 out of uh, a touched over 160 primary care practices are participating in the blueprint. So by far, the bulk of our practices. And then um, the practices would need to um, meet some care transformation requirements and their objective is to see that aligned across Medicaid and Medicare, really for Medicaid to take the lead on that. And I'll dig into that too in a moment. And then how, you know, they suggest some potential uses for this enhanced primary care payment. And they talk about, you know, investing in infrastructure, staffing, um, 
you know, mechanisms for um, performing advanced primary care. And they even give some examples of staffing types like care coordinators, mental health and substance use disorder um, treatment providers, and then community health workers. So, you know, payment, um, what does it take to even participate? And then how can some of those, um, how can the funds be used? Next slide. Um, this goes a little deeper on the eligibility criteria. So who can who can participate um, voluntarily in the model? Um, again, all types of practices, um, you know, hospital employed, federally qualified health centers, rural health clinics, independent practices, as long as they're in the region um, that the application is relevant to, they can participate in the model. Um, but they also have to be participating in the um, Medicaid model, which in our case would be the blueprint for health. And then um, uh, a note about hospital employed practices. If a hospital uh, in the AHEAD model is part of the hospital global budget component, then its owned practices are also eligible to participate in primary care AHEAD. If they're not, then they can't. The one exception for that is that if a hospital is affiliated with an FQHC or, you know, more likely owns those practices, those safety net practices um, can participate regardless of whether their affiliated hospital is participating. Next slide. So the next couple slides um, are our efforts to try and show um, sort of the current state of primary care payments um, and, and do some comparison between that and um, what is being offered under primary care ahead. So um, bear with me, you'll notice it says draft. Um, you know, this is a pretty dynamic um, environment, but um, we've attempted to capture um, what practices currently get um, under um, Vermont programs. So that first um, light green couple of rows um, really speaks to uh, practices that are participating in the ACO. And um, they, there's a couple of avenues for them to receive payments. Um, the first is for independent practices. As you all know, the ACO has the Comprehensive Payment Reform or CPR program. And, you know, there's, um, you know, just under 20 practices is my understanding of the latest number that are participating in this program with One Care. Um, they receive a um, fixed prospective. So this is where the capitation comes in um, per member per month payment um, for the, that's intended to cover sort of the standard primary care practices, those um, evaluation and management codes that all practices use. Um, and the way that that, my understanding is that the way that that amount is set is that um, Lung Care has actually established some primary care spend targets and uses that to, uh, as well as the um, funding coming in to establish that PMPM. For services that are outside of those standard services, um, you know, some of your non-core services, I don't know, maybe labs um, could be an example. Some practices provide that, some don't. Um, those are actually reimbursed at a little bit higher um, than the fee for service rate. So, um, I, I, you know, it's reconciled at the end of the year to 105% of, um, of those rates. And then there's an incentive um, per member per month 
payment as well um, to encourage participation, and that's at $5 p.m. p.m. So, you know, that's the CPR program. You know, a good chunk of the independent practices that um, work with one care are participating in that, um, and it provides some additional payment. All practices um, that participate, all primary care practices that participate with one care get um, what's called a population health payment. Um, and that is um, the last I knew for 2023, and I think it might change in 2024, but it was um, 475 per member per month um, for each attributed life. The, the, um, the, Practices have an opportunity to earn a bonus of um, up to a dollar per member per month um, if they achieve um, performance targets for um, measures, for selected measures. And I just want to note here that in terms of the Medicare members for all, you know, for these practices, they're getting payment for them, but Medicare is not contributing to that. So um, the, you know, the ACO, hospital dues, whatever, that's what is covering the Medicare portion of that. So while they're getting payment for Medicare members, it's not coming from CMS. So that's the ACO um, participating practices. The gray row um, talks about blueprint participating practices. And again, that's, um, you know, virtually all of our primary care practices. FQHCs are all participating hospital owned. So practices um, that participate in the blueprint by virtue of their recognition as patient-centered medical homes um, receive a base um, per member per month payment um, they vary by um, payer, um, but um, and Medicare is the lowest, but um, they do um, receive payments from each payer. The Medicare payment again runs through the ACO um, because we have a current agreement with CMS. If we don't continue to have an agreement, that would go away. Um, and then the practices can earn up to 50 cents PM PM based on their performance um, for um, certain utilization and quality measures. Um, but Medicare, they're not getting that. For hey, Pat, uh, let me interrupt. Uh, yeah, is there a 802-279-45 something or other? Just mute, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so those utilization and quality payments, they don't get, the practices don't get that for Medicare members. Medicare doesn't contribute to that. Um, they do get it for commercial and Medicaid. And then finally, um, the light blue row, uh, you know, the blueprint also has community health team funding that supports um, primary care. Sometimes it's even, you know, it's passed through to primary care practices um, for them to hire their own community health team staff. Um, and all three payers contribute to that um, for sort of the base um, community health team staffing. Again, you know, for practices that participate in the blueprint. And um, Medicare contributes again through that ACO payment. Um, I do want to note that Medicaid um, provides additional investments that can support primary care practices. Um, Medicaid funds the hub and spoke program. So if a primary care practice is a spoke, um, they'll get um, some funding to support staffing. Um, same with the Pregnancy Intention Initiative. Um, we have an enhanced um, pilot underway right now um, to support um, mental health and substance use disorder treatment and um, health-related social needs screening. And then um, the SASH program is 
almost wholly funded by Medicare dollars because it's a program for Medicare beneficiaries. Um, but Medicaid does provide some funding for SASH infrastructure. Um, and so again, in the dark blue, just to compare there, um, you know, Medicare is talking about an average of $17 per member per month um, for those Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries. Next slide is an effort to take some of, you know, to take that information and show how that $17 average PM PM that Medicare is offering stacks up against what's currently in place in Vermont. This is depending on what programs they participate in. So the column on the far left would represent a practice that is participating only in the blueprint, but not in the ACO. And so, as I had mentioned before, um, that you know Medicare is paying um, two fifteen per member per month um, in blueprint payments. So that's what you see for the blueprint only practice. For a practice in the um, second column that's participating in the blueprint and in the ACO, but is not an independent practice that's participating in the CPR program, you know, they'd get a bit more. So they get the 215 from the blueprint. They get um, the 475-ish um, for the ACO's population health um, base payment. They have the opportunity to earn an additional dollar um, through the ACO um, if they meet, um, you know, performance targets. So, you know, sort of the, the total there, if they got that, would be um, uh, just under $8 PM, PM. I again want to emphasize that the only thing that Medicare is paying dollars and 15 And then the third column shows um, independent primary care practices that are participating in the blueprint in the ACO and as part of their participation in the ACO are also participating in the comprehensive payment reform program. And so there you'll see everything that was in the prior column. And then, um, you know, there's the additional um, $5 um, PM PM that they receive for CPR. Um, you know, what we can't really show here because we don't know it is um, those non-core services that they might be getting um, additional payments for, that's not reflected here. Um, but it's an effort to show what it might look like for practice. Um, you know, I've heard anywhere from 17 to 19 practices, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood that are getting um, these additional payments. And so that's just under $13. Um, you know, a couple of things I want to, and then on the right, you see the $17 average um, PM, PM for um, the AHEAD model. So a couple of things I just want to make sure that we caveat. Um, this doesn't include community health team payments. Um, you know, again, practices either benefit from a centralized community health team staffing model, or they might get some resources to, to um, you know, to, to hire their own staff. Um, you know, after 2025, um, the, you know, the payments that we're seeing um, that are part of the ACO, would be likely would be likely to go away for Medicare. Um, Medicare is not going to, um, you know, that they won't still be involved in that model. And um, you know, so I, I there's just a couple of things that I I want to make sure folks are aware of there. And you know, again, the only thing that CMS is directly paying for at this juncture is that two dollar fifteen cent. 
um, blueprint payment. Okay. Ms. So Jones, try can, to I, can I interrupt with a couple? Oh. Can I interrupt with a couple questions? Sure. Um, and I'm hesitant to do this because whatever I do, like the next slide is what's going to answer, like has all the answers to what I was asking. But I'm going to try it anyway because I'm worried I'm going to forget. Okay. Um, what about the Medicare only ACOs and the savings um, that they then share out with their um, members, like for like vitalizing those? Would th those be included in this or is that separate? <sighs> Um, there are, you know, there's certain models that, um, that, so when CMS puts out these models, and I don't, I hope this is answering your question. Um, sometimes there can be model overlap and sometimes there can't be model overlap. And so it's possible that a practice, um, the Medicare only, um, ACOs, is that ACO reach? Um, is that the model that they support? Yes. One is and one is not. Okay. Um, because there can be um there could be some overlap for primary care practices. Um, but uh, you know, more comfortable like actually getting back to you on that because some of them like like I'll give an example making care primary is a model that CMS just released and primary care practices can't do that and ahead um, but they might be able to do reach and ahead um, and whether that means that how how any savings that they pay out would would mesh with a head, it's a little hard to say. Um, one thing that Medicare doesn't want to do is double pay. And so if they're paying out savings under one program and a um, and a, a provider is participating in another program, there might be some um, some adjustments there. But I guess I'd feel yeah. more comfortable getting back to you on that if that's okay. Chair Foster, CMS released a crosswalk of all of their programs, and I can make sure that that gets shared with the board and posted to our website. Um, but like Pat, it also just came out, and I do not have it memorized, so I can't I can't confirm that right now. But it was released, and I'll make sure that you all receive a copy, and I'll ask Kristen to post it to our website. Okay. Yeah. I and mean, what I was trying to understand was, um, like the total amount of money currently available in our programs, which are multiple, compared to the next model and how they stacked up. But then the second piece was, my second question was, you know, this is per member per month or per beneficiary, whatever, whatever it is. <clears throat> but the total amount to Vermont would depend on participation. So if the participation yeah. is much broader in the old programs versus the new program, the total absolute amount of dollars to the state could differ. Yes, that's correct. And um, you might recall that earlier I noted that there um, there might be, you know, that it could approach $17 million in terms of right. these enhanced primary care payments. But that would be um, if all primary care practices participated. So it's, um, you know, that's a big assumption there. And I will note also that the $2.15, um, CMS has made it um, clear that that would not continue for the blueprint. So that you can assume that that's subsumed into the $17, um, which is why we show it the way that we do in this very complicated graph. They've also made it clear, though, that they would like to, if we, if if Vermont were to move forward, if we were to be selected and move forward with a head, they'd like to continue to um, provide the payments um, that they're currently providing to support community health team and SASH um, ongoing. How the the mechanisms for that is going to be a little challenging. How the funding would flow, um, you know, what happens if not 
participate, for example. Um, you know, ha so it's gonna, there's some stuff that would need to be worked out there, but they have made it clear that they um, would be supportive of continuing those payments, presumably because those are programs that when they've done their um, evaluations have shown um, savings and, and um, outcomes that they like to continue to support. And then one other clarification, which I think I know the answer to, the primary care ahead dollars, that 17 or up to 17 million estimate for the state, that's all additive to Vermont. Whereas my understanding is some of the ACO population health management, the CPR money, that's not additive from Medicare. It's coming out of hospital dues. Right, right, right. Um, you know, the 215 blueprint is, yeah. The, it, it, just think of it in terms of the nine to 10, it's approaching $10 million now annually. Um, that includes the 215 PMPM, it includes the CHT payments, it includes um, the SASH payments. Um, the $17 is on top of Medicare fee for service rates. So for primary care, there's not downside risk here um, to participate in the AHEAD model. These are, this is Medicare's effort to say, we are going to increase investment in primary care and here's how we're going to do it. It's a pretty healthy PMPM, -PM, honestly, you know, based on what we're used to seeing. So, um, so yes. Yeah. So is the best, most raw way to consider this, like I'm trying to figure out which gives us more money and I want to make sure we're getting as much or more in the next effort. So we get nine to 10 million now for Blueprint and Sash and this new model gives us up to 17 million, but it depends on the scope of who participates. Is yeah, that fair? it's how many participate. And by the way, if Vermont participates in the model um, in ahead, CMS has indicated that that nine to 10 million would continue. Or so, you know, on that they top, would On top of 17. You know, we'll see, we'll see if we were to move forward, we would, you know, obviously want to look closely at that in a state level agreement, but that has been the signal that we've received from um, CMMI. Uh, Ms. Garavich has her hand raised. Um, thank you, Chairman Nolan. Um, so the issue here is on the participation. I just wanted to point out hospital needs to be under global budget for the affiliated providers to participate, right? So it's not independent primary care providers joining and receiving the enhanced payments. So that's a little bit nuanced in terms of the targets for participation. It's linked with the hospitals. Um, and then the other one, you did point out the hospital dues, I just to clarify, right? So that's the, I would consider that as a pass through since CMS is paying that additional 10 million to the hospitals and hospitals are paying to the blueprint. Um, just to clarify that it is not coming from hospitals budgets themselves. Uh, is that true for the CPR program? I So just to clarify, I think Sheila, you're right for the blueprint and sash dollars, but for the 475 and the other dollars, those are actually yeah. the hospitals pay dues to the ACO, which is what forms those other payments. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, Pat. That's okay. I okay. actually had one other question on this slide. Should I ask it now or hold it? Sure, go for it. I mean, if the chair is okay with that. <laughs> Definitely, please. So, Pat, the other thing that I wanted to uh, double check my memory on is, um, so the EPCP payments, how do those interact with the Medicare total cost of care? Are they included towards that target or are they excluded? I don't recall. So I'll take that one and answer it later. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, shall I go on? Please, yeah. Okay. 
Um, so this slide is again um, a CMS slide and with a couple of additions from us. But um, what this does is it really outlines what their expectations are for care transformation as they provide these additional uh, payments to primary care providers. And so they bucket them into really three um, intersecting areas. The first is health-related social needs. The second is um, what they call behavioral health integration. We call it mental health and substance use disorder treatment integration. And then they also um, have a bucket for care coordination. And what they've done here is they're providing some, these are really examples of the types of things that they would um, want to see in these areas um, from primary care supported by the additional payments. So under health-related social needs, they've included um, screening for health-related social needs. Um, they give an example of efforts to identify and strengthen relationships with community resources and organizations that address those needs and social drivers of health. And then they also talk about incorporating on-site um, social workers, community health workers, other types of staff um, that could help with resource coordination. In the mental health and substance use disorder um, treatment integration realm, some of the examples that they give are reporting on um, quality measures related to that care developing um, warm handoffs to mental health and substance use disorder providers and managing um, medications for people who are experiencing complex mental health and SUD conditions. And then finally, under care coordination, the examples they give relate um, to um, coordination with specialty care. So they talk about um, aligning referral systems across Medicaid and Medicare, um, you know, formalizing um, some of those specialty referrals and um, developing work streams that help establish relationships with specialty care providers. So those are some of the examples that they give, but those three areas are really what they see as key, um, the health-related social needs, uh, the mental health and SUD integration, and then the um, care coordination. So next slide. Wait, Pat, can I ask a question before you move on? Sorry, just a quick clarifying question. Sure. Um, uh, sure. It says it includes at the top, it says includes care transformation requirements, but you were describing them as examples. So yeah, is this going to be what, mandated or is this going to be, hey, you could do this if you like to? I think what they're looking for, the best I can tell, Dr. Holmes, is that what I think they're looking for is um, that, again, they want to take the lead from Medicaid. So I think they'll look for what they want to have, you know, see the Medicaid Advanced Primary Care Program, you know, focus on some of these things, what is going to be required, and then they would follow suit. Um, they've talked again about coming to the table there. And, um, you, you know, a lot, uh, you know, I'm going to rely heavily on the blueprint work because um, there's been some real focus in these areas and the blueprint for health. And so our intent would be to um, recommend those um, requirements as sort of the, you know, standard of care, really. So Thank I you. hope that helps. Next slide. So speaking of the blueprint, I did want to take a little detour and just remind folks, um, you know, some of the care transformation elements that are really already embedded in our blueprint for health program. I mentioned earlier, most primary care practices are participating in. So the first is that, um, you know, for a practice to participate, it, um, becomes recognized as a patient-centered medical home through the standards that the National Committee for Quality Assurance has put forth. Um, and so that's, um, you know, that's sort of the 
entry point into the Blueprint for Health program. And then, um, you know, community health teams are doing a lot of that work um, related to health related social needs, mental health and substance use disorder treatment and care coordination. So they've been set up, um, each region has a community health team. Um, they're multidisciplinary teams that um, the regions establish. Some of the examples of staffing include nurses, care coordinators, social workers, counselors, um, health educators, et cetera, community health workers. Um, so what we see um, around the state is that in some cases, um, st that staffing may be located centrally and it becomes a shared um, resource. Um, and that's especially helpful for um, patients and providers um, in those smaller practices. In some cases, the staffing is embedded um, in the practice, but um, the point is to really support um, access to those services and um, coordination of care. So that's, you know, this isn't like every state doesn't have this. And so um, it's a key element in addressing some of those transformation areas that CMS has expressed interest in. Next slide. We then have our extended services through the Blueprint for Health, and I've um, referenced these earlier, but the hub and spoke services um, for people experiencing opioid use disorder. Um, so the hubs, you know, really focus on that um, intensive um, care and treatment, and they're um, managed by the Vermont Department of Health. But then um, primary care providers and others, um, specialists as well, um, offer that office-based um, opioid treatment. And those um, practices receive financial support from Medicaid, um, but on behalf of the whole practice to, um, to support um, services for people that receive their care there. And then the Pregnancy Intention Initiative, similarly, this is a Medicaid-funded program. It can um, be for primary care or specialty practices. And the idea is to um, support um, people of childbearing age, um, access to long-acting re reversible contraception, um, enhanced screening for um, health and health-related social needs, and then some um, brief follow-up, if appropriate, within the office, and referral to health and community services. And then finally, um, the SASH program. Um, SASH, again, almost wholly funded by Medicare. So getting access to those Medicare funds in the current model, and potentially in future models is um, essential to, to SASH. Um, SASH provides wellness nurses and uh, care coordinators, care managers um, to work with um, elderly and disabled Medicare beneficiaries. Um, many of them live in um, housing facilities, but the program is also available to people in the community as well. Next slide. And then finally, this is our current expansion pilot um, that's underway now. Um, we received um, Medicaid appropriations from um, the legislature and the governor last session um, to implement a two-year pilot. Um, it is focused on improving access to mental health and SUD services and on addressing social determinants of health. Um, through integration with primary care. And this really um, is squarely aligned with the priorities that, um, that CMS has identified in the AHEAD model, which is really encouraging. Um, you know, we're trying to, I mean, you, you have heard about the concerns with increasing deaths from drug overdose and suicide and the acuity of um, conditions that we're seeing out in the community related to mental health and substance use 
disorder. And as well, social determinants of health and housing is obviously top of mind um, for folks in the current environment. The idea is to make sure that people are screened um, for health-related social needs, mental health and substance use disorder, um, that they receive um, brief intervention in the practice if appropriate, and navigation to services um, if more um, intensive services are needed um, out in the community. And, um, you know, the, the primary care providers need support to do this work. And so the, the intent of um, the model is to use the community health team funding mechanism, um, but to make sure that res resources get out to practices to do this um, enhanced work. So, so the, the reason I added these three slides is because it really does, the blueprint really does um, quite well with what um, CMS has indicated they'd like to see in terms of care transformation. Next slide. So a few words about um, quality. Um, I had mentioned that those enhanced primary care payments will be um, you know, adjusted for performance on quality measures. The way that CMS lays out the quality strategy in the AHEAD model is that they see there being three sets of quality measures. Um, and, and all of them, by the way, having that health equity focus. So um, the first is statewide measures, and I mentioned that in terms of the statewide accountabilities. Um, second is primary care measures, and third is um, hospital measures or quality programs. And they've highlighted um, four domains. Um, one is prevention and wellness, and there their goal would B to C equitable access to preventive services. Um, a, the second is population health, and there they're focusing on um, improving um, chronic conditions and then achieving um, high quality whole person equitable care across different population groups. Um, mental health and substance use disorder, they want to comes there, um, healthcare quality and utilization. Um, there they've talked about reducing avoidable admissions and readmissions, and then improving person experience of care. So those are the domains. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see what they are suggesting for uh, a primary care measure set. They, you know, they're saying that they'll require five measures for those primary care practices that are participating in the AHEAD, and they've listed, you know, potential measures or, you know, their, their recommendations for measures. They have said that if, if an award recipient, and by that they mean a state or a sub-state region, um, if, if they wish to propose an alternative measure, um, because, you know, to align with CMS uh, would consider it um, as replacements as long as the alternative measure aligns to a domain below or to model goals broadly. So there's some latitude there, um, but these are the measures that they're recommending. And frankly, they're, um, you know, familiar to us. Um, we have some of these in our current model. They're um, you know, some pretty standard measures. So under the prevention and wellness um, domain, they're saying that practices would need to choose at least one of these. And the two that they recommend are colorectal cancer screening and breast cancer screening. Under chronic conditions, again, they're saying that practices need to choose at least one. And there they are looking at controlling high blood pressure and hemoglobin A1C poor control for people with diabetes. For mental health and substance use disorder, disorder they are requiring this measure unless an alternative is approved. 
And um, that would be the screening for depression and follow up plan. Again, a measure that's um, quite familiar to us. And then under healthcare utilization, they're saying that um, both of these would be required emergency department utilization and acute hospital utilization. So these are the measures that they're um, recommending or saying that they'll require for primary care practices that um, choose to participate. So um, five out of these seven measures. Next slide. Uh, Ms. Jones, do you, do you mind if I interrupt? Um... Sure. It might make sense to take a little break, I think, just so okay. people can stay focused, if that's OK with you. Would this be? Um, yeah, why don't, why don't we go ahead and take a little break? Uh, why don't we come back at 3.05? So we'll just take like a 10 minute break. We can continue whenever you're ready. OK, um, yeah, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, in a similar fashion to how I shared the application requirements for the primary care investment um, work, this shows the application requirements um, in that <clears throat> notice CMMI put forth around their vision for primary care transformation and practice recruitment. Um, so again, noting their focus on alignment with Medicaid efforts, um, the first row talks about having current Medicaid initiatives underway in uh, primary care, and especially those that are related to mental health and substance use disorder integration, health-related social needs. Um, care management and specialty care coordination. <clears throat> the second row um, talks about tools um, that might be leveraged to increase Medicaid investment in um, primary care. Um, and they give some examples there. You know, one thing I want to note here is that, um, you know, a lot of states have um, commercial or private um, Medicaid managed care organizations um, that are um, providing coverage uh, for Medicaid beneficiaries in those states. And um, just to note that in Vermont, um, we do not have that type of a construct. And so um, DIVA serves as, um, you know, the um, organization that supports uh, Medicaid coverage. So that, that changes things a bit when you look at um, some of these requirements. Third, um, they talk about what are some tools um, for increasing access to primary care services. Uh, and again, they really focus on what's happening with um, Medicaid primary care alternative payment models, our FQHCs and rural health clinics participating in that, and how can um, primary care ahead align with those efforts. They ask, they ask for a detailed um, plan for recruiting primary care practices to participate in primary care ahead. Um, and there they're saying, how will the state or substate region identify practices that are participating in programs and how will they conduct recruitment outreach to those providers? This is again where, you know, the fact that the Blueprint for Health um, is um, centered in the Agency of Human Services and um, we don't have those um, private Medicaid managed care organizations. We know very clearly right off the bat um, what practices are participating and how to reach them. So, um, so, but they do want to see that detailed recruitment plan. And then similarly, they want to know what types of practices 
are currently participating in the Medicaid primary care alternative payment model, um, and where are their gaps? Um, and as I mentioned before, we have about 130 practices um, participating in the blueprint, and um, a, of a total of 60 or a little better. And, um, you know, most of the practices that aren't participating, um, they might be um, practices that are direct pay practices, so don't participate in Medicaid. Um, they might be um, naturopathic practices, small independent practices, but, you know, we, uh, there are, you know, so we should look at that, but we definitely have most of the practices in our, in our current uh, program. Next slide. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes on, um, you know, how we've engaged with uh, with primary care um, providers. So this is our current advisory group structure. Um, we have a healthcare reform work group at the Agency of Human Services, as you know, and then there are some subgroups um, underneath that. And, you know, we ob obviously collaborate strongly with um, efforts, but we have a hospital global budget technical advisory group. There's a Medicare waiver technical advisory group, and we have a primary care advisory group, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. And um, we have a payer advisory group. Some of these are more active at different times than others, but um, that's the current structure. And too from before my time in my current role, but um, during the summer and fall of uh, 22, um, some groups met that really, um, you know, outlined some principles and really um, provide some foundation. One was a short-term provider stability work group that really looked at addressing some of those challenges um, in system capacity um, and the work is um, ongoing um, at AHS and elsewhere to really try and shore up uh, some of those systems. Um, there was a prior global budget group and a total cost of care subgroup as well, um, but the four that are um, currently active to varying degrees, as I said, are these. And so I want to spend a little time on um, primary care. Next slide. So, um, you know, here's some of the forums that we've used to um, try and, um, you know, share information and get input from primary care providers. The first is your primary care advisory group. Um, so we've been to three meetings of that group, um, you know, talking about what's happening with healthcare reform and the AHEAD model in particular. Um, and so most recently we were there on January 17th. And then, um, as I said, AHS has the primary care work group that you saw on the prior slide. Um, and that work group includes um, membership from primary care providers, um, leaders of um, associations. Uh, Michelle Degree is um, part of that group. And then um, a representative from One Care as well because of the CPR program. And that group has met seven times since October, and we have at least two more meetings scheduled with that group. And just some of the material that I present today um, is material that they've seen and on primary care ahead and make sure we understand it to the best of our ability. We've met um, a few times with, um, there's a healthcare association coalition, and that includes, um, groups that represent primary care. So the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, by State Primary Care Association, uh, Health First um, and others. And so, um, you know, we've gone to several of those meetings to share um, what information we can and hear their questions and comments. And then there's ad hoc meeting requests. Uh, 
first leadership uh, by state's board and so forth. So we're um, doing what we can to share what information we have with um, primary care organizations. Next slide. So I, I, I wanted to sort of end with this because, um, you know, I think it sort of circles us back to, you know, what are some of the challenges that we're trying to address. And so um, both at the January meeting of the uh, your um, primary care advisory group, and then again um, with the AHS primary care work group, we we asked a question, which is, you know, what would great primary care look like for your patients? And so the next two slides um, attempt to summarize the really robust feedback that we received from both groups. Um, and you'll see that there it won't be news to you for this type of feedback as well. But I think it just helps remind us um, what we're trying to do here on behalf of um, Vermonters in the area of primary care. So um, next slide, please, Michelle. So um, the AHS work Back. Um, you know, they said it would, you know, what we'd like to do and what we think would be great primary care would be moving from reactionary crisis management to proactive wraparound wellness care. Um, we'd like to be able to provide team-based care. And to do that, um, we would want to see robust support staff. So that includes nursing, mental health, social services, so that we can address people's health-related social needs as well as their health care needs. Reduced administrative burden is something that we um, hear quite a bit, and this group um, uh, highlighted that as well. You know, workforce definitely is a concern. So the ability to recruit more primary care providers and ensure that they're properly supported um, in order to meet people's needs. Discussion about you know, let's transition. You know, it would be nice to be able to look at a whole, a total patient panel and make sure that the way that we're using our resources um, ensures that they have access to the care that they need. They talked about increasing engagement with the community and also um, you know, making sure that there's outreach to populations and people who may not be seeking um, primary care. And then um, eliminating barriers, so administrative barriers, regulatory barriers um, that prevent practices and providers from uh, offering the best possible care to their patients. So that was that's a summary of what we heard from the HS primary care work group. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll see a lot of commonality. And there is a little bit of overlap between the two groups, but not much. And um, and so you'll see, you know, similar themes from the primary care advisory group. Um, one provider from the PCAG said, you know, time with patients is really the currency of primary care was the way he put it. And so ensuring that there's adequate time to listen to patients and to talk about options. And sort of in concert with that, um, you know, trying to, you know, achieve some reductions in paperwork. In other words, it shouldn't take more time to document a visit in an electronic health record than the time of the actual visit. Availability, and this speaks to, you know, access, patients being able to see providers when they want to, primary care being close to home, and everyone in the state having a primary care provider and seeing them each year, so having been seen in the past year. 
sure that care is affordable. And again, talking about um, sort of panel sizes, um, one provider talked about having a panel of about 1,500 patients, and then that and that that was really too much, especially um, when thinking about the complexity of many um, folks. And so she suggested that 1,200 per provider might be a more reasonable. Um, panel size. Again, this group talked about team-based care and preventive care and a desire to be able to support people in addressing um, health-related social needs like housing and food insecurity. Physicians and nurses um, being supported to work at the top of their licenses and flexibility and creativity in how care can be delivered. So um, in addition to office-based visits, what about home visits? For um, good team-based care. Um, providers um, talked about a capitated payment and value-based payment and, um, you know, emphasize the value of the um, CPR program or something similar to that. Making sure there are adequate resources outside of the office, so the ability to make those connections for patients to mental health care, home health services, rehabilitation services, and others. Similar to the um, AHS group, um, how can we encourage more people to go into primary care? Um, can we prioritize primary care and training? And then um, noting that, you know, some people may continue to see specialists when it's appropriate for them to um, go back to primary care once, you know, they've um, achieved some stability. So just making sure that care is redirected from specialists to primary care when appropriate. So that's, um, that's all I had in terms of slides. Um, again, wanted to end on that because I think it circles back to what do we hope for? What are our hopes and dreams um, in this work that we do? And, um, you know, how can we address some of those challenges in um, healthcare? Thank you. Thank you for your patience and time. Thank you for spending your time with us. Um, I'll open up to the board for any questions or comments they have for Ms. Jones. I'll just go ahead and jump in. Um, Elena looked up the answer to my question, so I thought I'd just um, mention what that is so that Pat doesn't have to follow up with that mm -hmm. in case others are interested. Um, but the the 17 p.m. p.m. is not included in the Medicare total cost of care performance totals in the first three years of the models, which I thought was interesting because it shows um, sort of an interest on Medicare's part in investing in primary care um, early in the model. So I just wanted to uh, say that out loud so other folks would not would have the benefit of that information. And thank you to Elena for multitasking and sending that to me. Thank you. I would have guessed that they would want to show that support. So it's good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, I'll um, jump in next, I guess. Um, thanks, Pat, uh, for coming in again today. Um, I've really appreciated the monthly updates and I've been trying to follow um, the CMS and CMMI websites to learn more about the AHEAD model. Um, and I've, I've got a couple of concerns that I wanted to talk through. Um, I don't know that you'll be able to, anybody will be able to answer them directly, um, but I wanted to share them. <clears throat> Um, and I guess first, in lines with the with the 17 million that we've been talking about, my understanding from the the websites and other information is that that would include the nine million for blueprint. It wouldn't be 17 million in addition. Um, but I'm not an expert. I haven't spent as much time as others. Um, but it's a big chunk. So um, I want to stick a pin in that to look at further. Um, 
in addition, I, a lot of the dollars that were described today, my reading from the websites, um, they are dependent on provider participation and successfully meeting um, cost reduction targets. But participation has always been limited um, among Vermont um, providers. We haven't met any scale targets for the first all payer model, and we were reprimanded for falling behind before COVID. <clears throat> Um, we also have a low, we're a low cost state for Medicare. That's been said over and over. So it'd be, I think it'd be difficult to reduce our costs much further. So I worry that the model's not tightly aligned with what Vermonters need right now. And for that reason, because there's not tight alignment, <clears throat> I think CMS could also see that. And that because they see there's not a tight alignment with um, what we need and what we can provide them, that we may not be selected. And we saw a lot of information today, and we have over years, about the great benefits that Blueprint and SASH bring to Vermonters. But I, I haven't heard a lot about developing contingencies for how we'll fund those services if we're not selected. And that's a, that's a big worry of mine. Um, I worry about that because the model, the AHEAD model, is meant to help control Medicare's expenses by reducing the amount of money that it pays out to providers, particularly hospitals, because that's where the money is. Those are the high cost things. Um, CMS thinks that we could reduce <clears throat> cost to Medicare um, if we reduced overused and unnecessary hospitalizations. And it introduces this idea of the idea of equity, because in places that have decreased utilization across the country, the utilization has dropped most among brown and black people. And so the model's meant to incentivize a reduction of utilization, but to make sure brown and black people continue to gain access to the care that they need. So the equity component's new, but the rest of the model isn't. It's based on the ACO model that we've been grappling with for about a decade. Um, so th I think that that's important because we we don't have a lot of brown and black people in our state. We're pretty homogeneous. And so the lessons learned from our state in regards to equity um, I think it'd be hard to generalize that to a more heterogeneous state. Um, I think the reason that CMS wants to invest so much in primary care um, isn't to reduce primary care administrative burden or increase the amount of time they have with patients or to reduce panel size. It's because an investment in primary care can lead to better care of patients with ambulatory care sensitive conditions. And that in turn would reduce hospitalizations. The, these models are meant to reduce the utilization of unnecessary or overused services. But in Vermont, we don't have an overutilization problem. In fact, um, just a couple of weeks ago, Diva was presenting to us <clears throat> and um, described a report by Mathematica from December of 2023. And they found little overuse or unnecessary hospital services uh, for patients with Medicare in the state. And that's consistent with Dartmouth Atlas data that goes back decades. Um, and meanwhile, the Kaiser Family Foundation and others, in, including a report by Wakely Consultants just a couple of weeks ago, tell us that the big problem about healthcare costs in Vermont are prices. The Wakely consultants calculated that 88% of the increases in insurance premiums were due to high hospital prices, while just 12% was utilization. So we don't have an overutilization problem, we have an access problem. And the AHEAD model is a complex multi-tool to reduce overutilization 
but we need something like a screwdriver, a simpler tool that addresses prices. Um, so that I don't think there's a good alignment between what the tool, what the model's supposed to do and what Vermonters need. And I think, and as I said, I, I worry that CMS is gonna see that. Um, they're gonna see our cost and pricing and racial data, um, and we may not be selected. And we won't, we can't achieve as much savings for them. And any findings about equity from our state won't really generalize to a less to a less homogeneous state or a more heterogeneous state. And so that creates this angst for me that if we get if we are selected, the model may not address our needs. But if we are not selected, we'll lose blueprint and sash funding and I haven't heard much about contingency plans for if we lose that. Um, so I wanted to share those concerns. Um, and I wanted to thank you for coming in again and talking us through this. It's an overwhelming about, amount of information to try to follow. So um, I appreciate your time and the chance to share these comments. Thank you. Um, Chair Foster, would you like me to try to address some of this or? Uh, you're welcome to if you'd like, sure. Um, sure, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I took notes. Um, <laughs> thank you, Member Walsh. Um, so um, I, I guess I'll try and go in order um, with some of the concerns that you've raised. Um, the first, in terms of the nine to ten million dollars, um, our understanding from CMS is that that would be in addition to the enhanced um, primary care um, payments. Um, so we could continue to, if we were select get into negotiations with CMS, we would certainly want to um, be very clear and verify mm -hmm. that. Um, in terms of um, the funding, and again, that 17 million was an estimate, and in terms of that being dependent on um, provider participation, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, what we've seen is good uptake in the blueprint for health. Um, we've seen good, you know, um, you know, the majority practice participation there and in the the ACO programs. And so um, while um, it's it is definitely dependent on that, the fact that it's a upside um, only program, there's not um, downside risk for providers, whether that would encourage them to um, participate or not. Hard to say. You know, I do want to note that if hospitals don't participate, then their own practices would not be able to participate unless they're a rural health clinic. So, you know, that's definitely a risk. And I, I want to make sure that I um, don't gloss over that. Um, you know, the low cost state um, reducing costs, I think that again is going to be something that we're going to, uh, you know, if we were selected, we'd really want to focus on in um, discussions and negotiations with CMS. CMS has very clearly stated publicly that, um, you know, they realize that budget neutrality. Um, might be a more um, achievable goal, particularly for low cost states. Um, so, you know, uh, we have her and that they're really focused on equity um, quality as well. And so we want to, you know, keep tabs on that because that's going to be really important in terms of whether this is a model um, that works for Vermont or not. And as you said, um, you know, it's not a done deal that we're selected. So contingencies in terms of um, blueprint and sash. Um, 
you know, Blueprint is a multi-payer program, so um, we would um, continue to have um, presumably Medicaid involvement, commercial involvement in the Blueprint. Um, SASH is a greater risk because, as we talked about earlier, uh, I mean, it's a risk for Blueprint, too, because the Medicare component is important, even if um, they're not um, paying for every every element of the blueprint. They're paying for patient-centered medical homes. They're paying for um, you know community health teams, at least that core um, community health team component. Um, so that's a risk, um, big risk for SASH, and you know I think that's something we'd um, have to talk about um, collectively with um, you know state leaders on that yeah. one because it's it's a concern. Um, and again, you mentioned uh, controlling costs and reducing costs. Um, that's you know it's going to have to work for Vermont where it's not. Let's keep reducing costs if there aren't places to reduce costs. Um, mm -hmm. Equity, um, there, there are some opportunities in Vermont. Um, sure. There's, um, you know, black and brown people, as you mentioned. There's, um, there's rurality. There's socioeconomic status. Um, you know, the health department is currently engaged in some community work around um, what the next uh, state health assessment shows and what the next state health improvement plan should look like. And there's some um, clear focus on equity there. So there are opportunities. And, you know, part of it, um, you know, with Vermont is we do have small numbers. I mean, we're a small mm -hmm. number state, period. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it might limit either what measures we look at. You're going to, you know, you're going to need to look at measures that a large segment of the population um, mm -hmm. is eligible for. Um, and it might mean looking at multiple years of data, but you know, we it's an area that we um can and should focus on. So yeah. recognizing the challenges, but also recognizing the opportunities there. Um and then um, you know, the our the discussion about why primary care investment. Um, yes, I think um it does, you know, have some opportunity for improving results on those ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Um, you know, there's research that shows that investment in primary care leads to better outcomes as well as um, better financial picture. So, um, you know, don't disagree with you there on the mode of um, for increasing invest investment in primary care, um, but it's an area that's being talked about nationally um, and that, you know, other states are looking at as well. So, I mean, I know I kind of superficially touched on a lot of the points, but um, hopefully um, we can keep the discussion going. Hopefully that's helpful. But, you know, I'll say again, the application is the first step. Um, you know, we'd have to get selected and it would have to be a model that made sense in Vermont. Um, if we were not selected or we did not wish to proceed, will health care reform come to a screeching halt? No. Um, we have Medicaid efforts in health care reform. We have commercial payer efforts in health care reform. Does it help? a lot to have Medicare at the table under the right circumstances. Yes, it does. So, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you, Pat. Thank you for the um, the willingness to dialogue. Um, I, I um, do want to say just one more thing with, with equity. I did not mean to suggest that we don't have equity challenges in our state. I strongly believe that we do. Um, but I, my point was that in that we're a homogeneous state, and it's sometimes easier to make decisions about what to do um, in a homogeneous setting. A lot of people point to Scandinavia as an example of this. 
um, that they're able to come to a consensus about an approach um, more easily than uh, countries that are more heterogeneous, where there's more tension between the majority and minority uh, groups. So I think that that's where we don't quite, um, I don't know how valuable uh, CMS would see us because we're so homogeneous. Um, but we do have a strong history of a, a, a solid working relationship with Medicare. And I think that that's valuable. And I appreciate all the work that you're doing to try to shepherd this through. Um, but I just, I wanted to raise my concerns because um, Vermonters are paying me to think about these things and share my concerns. So I appreciate you listening and I appreciate the, the, the polite um, dialogue back and forth. Thank you. And, you know, I'd really, and likewise, um, I'd really like to also give um, a nod to the um, Health Equity Advisory Commission um, that's been established. And um, we've been able to um, meet with the co-chairs of that group. And, um, you know, they're interested and excited in working together. And um, so I, j I just want to um, give a nod to them as, um, and thank them for being willing to um, teach us and talk with us and also the um, Vermont Department of Health for the work that they're doing in that arena as well. So thank you. Yeah. I'll hop on next. Um, so Pat, thank you. You know, I, I can imagine all of the teams that are doing hard work here and uh, the hundreds of hours that have been put in to try and think about this model and to try and, you know, make this application. Um, and, you know, every time you come, I, I realize there's lots to like about the model. I think the focus on equity, I think the focus on primary care and primary prevention and, you know, enhanced payments are all hugely potentially valuable to Vermont. Um, and so there's plenty to, 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 to like about the model, and I think it's definitely worth exploring, and I'm glad that we're applying for it. Um, and I recognize that just applying for it is the start of a, of a long process. So what I'm about to say is about what I'm hoping we'll see in that, you know, post-application, uh, time period before we have to sign a final agreement, the types of analyses that I think would at least help me, and I'm speaking just as one board member who may have to vote on whether we go ahead with a head. Um, I'm just thinking in advance and and thinking about what I'm, I would, it would be helpful for me to see, to feel confident that I'm making the right decision for Vermonters. So one of them is an evaluation of a head against the next best alternative. So I know I've mentioned this before, but what happens and, you know, to use Tom's language a bit, like what is the contingency plan here or what is the next best alternative? What other health care reform, uh, you know, uh, efforts have been considered, um, evaluated and decided we're not as good as a head? And, you know, the things that we can throw out there could be reference based pricing. It could be rate setting with targeted increased reimbursements for primary care, for mental health, for substance abuse. I mean, there's things that we could alternatively do and consider. Um, and I just think if we could understand what that next best alternative is and then compare what we expect to come from ahead versus that next best alternative, whatever it is. Uh, what are the federal dollars coming in under each model? What is the cost containment expectations under each model, the access implications, the equity implications, the quality implications, the workforce recruitment and retention implications, the administrative cost implications under each model? I think that would help me know that we're making the best effort here. If you think about your slide seven, which I think is a really good slide, it lays out all of the challenges. I don't know if Michelle, you can just pull that up for a second if that's possible. It's the one where it's why healthcare reform. I think it's a really good slide. It lays out the challenges. What would really be helpful to me is to be able to look at all of those bullets and say, under a head, we're gonna do better on all of those bullets than under the next best alternative, whatever that might be. Um, in terms of healthcare reform. So knowing that this is, you know, our, our best approach. 
And I think for me also, I think we have to have a real conversation. There's no model that's perfect. Every model has intended, you know, implications and unintended consequences. And so for me to be aware upfront of the downside risks and then to develop strategies to mitigate against those risks is really important to have those conversations soon, um, you know, before we embark on a new model so that we know that we have the mitigation strategies in place. And so, you know, I think access is coming up as a, uh, for example, you know, one of the potential downside risks is, does, is there less incentive to solve the already, you know, prominent access challenges that we have in the state? So how do we address that? The other one, you know, as this bullet point suggests is insurance coverage and commercial. And how do we think about, you know, the, the model will probably help us contain costs for Medicaid or be budget neutral for Medicare potentially. What are we doing about the commercial side of the, of, of the population? So how will we ensure through this model affordability for commercial uh, rate payers, for businesses? Um, how will we ensure insurance coverage uh, is going to be a possibility for people who are in the private markets? So. I want to think about that so that we can, again, think about strategies to address those. I also um, want to think about, and it would be helpful for us to understand, um, the system's preparedness. Is the system prepared? Have we done an assessment of whether we have the infrastructure in place for success? Do we have enough long-term care beds and mental health beds to be able to move people out of hospitals and into those more appropriate care settings? Do we have the workforce in place to be able to ensure that we can actually meet the primary care targets um, that we're gonna be setting and to be able to reduce the avoidable you know, uh, care that perhaps exists in the, state, in the state? Do we have the data analytics tools and the you know, care management tools and the health information uh, necessary to be able to make this work. So I, I just want to make sure that we're assessing the system's preparedness. And if we were to assign the agreement, as we're thinking about the agreement, the regulatory apparatus is, you know, to develop, for example, global budgets, to monitor hospital performance, to mitigate against some of the downside risk is not inconsequential. So an analysis I think we would need to do and make is, how much fee-for-service revenue must be, for example, in a global budget to make that all worthwhile, to get the system change that we're going to need to make the apparatus and the cost of that apparatus worthwhile? How many hospitals do we need in? How many payers do we need in? What is the critical mass that we need in the model to make the apparatus that we're going to have to put into place to manage it and to oversee it worth the expense? Um, you know, I, you know, I could see in the timeline the hope is that you have one payer in and then you have 30% of Medicare fee-for-service in after a few years. To me, that doesn't feel like enough revenue in the model and enough participants in the model necessarily to make the, 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 the apparatus cost-effective. So I, those are sort of things in our analysis. What would we need to have uh, in the model to generate the delivery system reform that we want and to make the the regulatory structure that's going to have to be put into place worthwhile. So these are just analyses that I'm hoping, I'm, I'm asking about it now and recognizing that you don't have these answers now and that this is something, this is this is a step two, step one is applying, but I just want to articulate that for me, these are the types of analyses that will help me feel confident that when it comes time to make a decision that we have all the answers um, to know, not all the answers, you never have all the answers, but we've done the appropriate analysis and the due diligence to say, given the information that we have now, this makes sense for Vermonters. So I thought I would share the, some of those thoughts with you today in the hopes that we can continue that conversation over the next few months. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Chair Foster, would you like me to um, respond to that? I Yeah, totally up to you, Pat, any of these, if you okay. want to, yeah. please. Yeah, I'll make a um, couple of comments a lot there. Um, clearly things that we're all um, thinking about. And um, yes, it's, it's um, incredibly difficult when, um, you know, alternatives are not extensive and, um, 
and the questions are many. Um, you know, in terms of um, the next best alternative, well, we know, you know, again, we have um, healthcare reform efforts in our state um, that um, should be able to continue um, without Medicare, um, but there's no question that it would hurt. And our understanding of the alternatives that would be available to ensure Medicare participation are number one, um, reversion to fee-for-service uh, Medicare payments. And number two, the model, the other model that appears to be um, still open um, is uh, Medicare shared savings program. So, you know, that would be uh, Medicare only. Um, there would be some fragmentation there um, in terms of alignment of reform efforts, but um, those are our understandings of the, of the options. Um, you know, in term, and the analyses that you're suggesting, um, like, make all manner of sense and um, we will do our level best to um, to um, provide whatever analyses we can. In terms of, um, you know, sort of some of the risks and unintended consequences, you know, access is a key one with a model like this where you um, are looking, and I'm thinking not so much on the primary care side. In fact, I think, um, you know, what CMMI is articulating in terms of enhanced payments and, um, you know, increased investment in primary care actually has the potential to help um, access to primary care. Um, and we, you know, we haven't talked a lot today about hospital global budgets, but whenever you're looking at a um, payment mechanism like that, where it's a set amount, you know, you want to make sure that you're um, robustly monitoring for access. And so that's going to need to be a key part of this model. Aside from what measures um, CMS requires, um, that's a framework that we would want to um, really thoughtfully craft um, so that we make sure that we're, uh, you know, keeping, you know, monitoring access. Um, and, you know, similarly in terms of, uh, commercial insurer coverage and affordability, um, that's going to really hinge on um, the how we construct the model with Medicare's participation so that we're getting adequate um, fu federal funds as well um, to help support that. Um, system preparedness, um, you know, we do have the um, 12 million in cooperative agreement funding. I'm not going to pretend that that's enough to um, get a system ready, but um, it does um, help um, jumpstart um, some of that preparedness. And we're doing a lot of work um, in addition there. When I think about what um, the agency that I work for has done in um, recent years around, um, you know, an alternative payment model for the Brattleboro Retreat, for example. Um, some, uh, you know, looking at rates and um, trying to um, increase rates. Um, I believe the secretary uses a number of 164 million in investments in recent years to really try, try and help shore up um, some of those areas where we know from uh, hearing from providers that there are some challenges, mental health, home health, um, long-term care, skilled nursing facilities. So those efforts are ongoing, um, have been ongoing, and will continue um, to try and make sure that the system is prepared um, to meet the needs of Vermonters. Uh, and, you know, there's been some workforce initiatives that have um, uh, been um, implemented as well. And in terms of data, you know, our teams work together um, with the data resources that we have, but we are definitely focused on 
um, and continue to be focused on the HIE. You've seen our strategic plan there, but making sure that um, that includes um, comprehensive data from a variety of sources and in a way that's usable for um, analysis and care. Uh, and then, uh, and then, in uh, the last point I'll make, you had mentioned um, how much fee for service revenue is needed. You know, one of the things that uh, CM CMMI asks for in the application is what are the policy levers at ten percent of um, net patient revenue, Medicare net patient revenue under the model in year one, and thirty percent by year four. Those are minimum. Um, minimum amounts. We have talked in the hospital global budget technical advisory group about options for, you know, do you start out voluntary, um, mandatory, you know, do you phase into a mandatory? And that applies to both um, hospitals and commercial insurers. And, um, you know, so that's a, that's something we're going to have to, the type of analysis that you're talking about really helps us ascertain whether we want to take a um, more voluntary approach. And that's what we've done with the current model. And we've gotten some, you know, we've gotten decent uptake, but but is it enough to make it worth it? That's a really good question. And um, we do have levers at our disposal, um, as you said, you know, establishing the regulatory apparatus at us to implement those is uh is is um you know not an easy lift but but we do have um mechanisms for working with providers and seeing if we can um reach uh, an appropriate level of participation if we decide if we are selected and if we decide to move forward with the model so thank you. I hope again a bit of a cursory um, response, um, but I'm taking careful notes. So thank no, you. No, I appreciate it, and I didn't expect all the answers today. I was just saying these are the types of you know answers over the next 15, 16 months that it would be helpful to see. So I appreciate that they're already, of course, on your radar. You're thinking about it, and uh, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Pat. We might need 15 or 16 years, but I guess we don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>
thinks is the right way to tackle that, we could try to negotiate something. So we could go into that sort of the considerations in more detail in the executive session about the you know potential negotiation levers. Um, I think that's all I have for now. I had a lot to say last time, so I'll pass to somebody else so it doesn't get too late here. Um, just a couple quick ones. Um, so, so far we've sort of been at the high level of sort of the goals and here's what we're trying to do and here's what, you know, is on the table. And I think getting into the substance and the meat of like how it's going to do those things and um, what the risks are and all of the more substantive points of how this would work, I think will be really helpful in in the coming months as we evaluate this. So, for example, if we talk about avoidable utilization, and that's a key you know, component of making the program work well, what utilization specifically are we talking about and where is it going and how is it getting there, right? And so, for example, I mean, we you hear about it all the time, the problems with hospitals discharging patients. So if we're trying to avoid ED utilization or post acute, put people in post acute care that's appropriate, do we have that? And if we don't, what kind of risk does that create? And this might be like too simplistic, but I understand the whole theory. Um, but so you're trying to put more money into preventative care, but it, it's not so simple as changing the payment model. And then all of a sudden you'll have the preventative care or the long-term care that you're going to need. So like a hospital can't just get rid of the orthopedic surgeons it has and add mental health and long-term care and primary care. They have people that work there that do things and just rejiggering is, is much more complicated. So I guess understanding sort of the risks and abilities to, to make these changes so that the program and model works well would be really, really helpful going forward. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot of what uh, Member Holmes said, I thought was really thoughtful in terms of like the evaluation and the analysis of what we're doing. So I'm, I've been looking at bills that we get for our contractors and I've been looking at COAG funding budgets and it's in a tremendous amount of money. And I guess understanding what the financial investment is for the state to do it. And I mean by that, I mean, for us, for you really, Pat, who's doing the lion's share of this, God bless you. But just to do the application, to do the negotiation, to then come up with a regulatory process, for then like hiring contractors to track all of the total cost of care and the quality, right? Then on top of that, for a hospital to be able to make the transformation, a hospital to have two budgets, a hospital to have two budget review processes, the air board to have two budget review processes, all of those expenses are quite massive. And I wanna make sure we're understanding all of those. And they may be like a great investment because there are additional monies that are really important to the state here that we could get. But just really understanding them on a granular level, I think would be beneficial. And then also considering the scope, right? Because if we're talking about whether or not it's a mandatory program or a voluntary program or whatever it might be, insurance, not insurance, all those costs are much better when they're spread out between 14 hospitals that are participating with full commercial participation, um, right? So they might not be bearable or worth it if it's two hospitals and no commercial. They might be a really good investment if it's the entire system. And then that also goes back to my first concern or question, I guess I should say, which is um, whether or not it will work and what the risks are to it working. And if it's only one hospital with 30, 40, 50% of its money, um, maybe it doesn't solve as much as we had hoped. So then there's an opportunity cost in that I know you, Pat, for sure, have no capacity to work on any other really substantive reform things. I know our staff and board members don't either. So, right, there's, so we can't do other things because we're very focused on this. And that might be the best thing we can do. Um, but if it ends up being a really small scale and scope, um, it's just something to consider. I guess the last thing I would just say is um, that the access measures, the utilization points that members Walsh and Holmes made are really important to make sure that we're not losing access and that the model works for our access issues. 
um, but then the protection for commercial and and how do we make sure that we don't have really huge large increases on the commercial market here in the state that we've had for the last several years and how do we protect against that in this model so i don't have any questions if you want to respond you can pat these are just kind of food for thought things to kind of keep track of as we go ahead thank you chair foster i'll just respond very quickly um you know the question about um how we can address things like avoidable utilization given some of what we're seeing in the healthcare system you know we've touched on this earlier but it's really a multifaceted approach where you know we look at um what can the state do to help shore up those systems and i can assure you that we're um quite focused on that um what are some of the investments coming into the system under a model like this um and how can we best use them and um recognizing the longer time frame in this model um, I think does show an understanding um, on the federal government's part that we're not going to be able to um, make these changes and solve all these problems overnight. Um, but if we focus on them, we can, um, you know, um, resolve them over a, a time period of a few years. Um, you know, yes, I think we have to look at what it what the um, financial investments required would be and then um you know your linkage of that to scale um and participation levels makes it makes a lot of sense and um you know we have to determine whether it's um something that we want to move forward with and if so how um, to encourage the appropriate level of participation. And then just would reinforce um, your last two points that access measures are going to be key. And, uh, you know, we want to know what's happening with utilization. Sure, if there's potentially avoidable utilization, are we seeing a reduction in those areas, maybe partly because of um, improvements in the system? Um, are there um, areas where we're, you know, where we would want to keep an eye on whether people are getting appropriate care? Absolutely. And um, ensuring that we can address affordability in the commercial market um, is, is, is essential. So thank you. Yeah, and so much of that turns on the negotiation. So you had on slide 11, yeah. you had so many of the benefits, right? And all those benefits influence reimbursements, continued recognition, low cost care, baseline recognizes past savings, all of those not all of them, most of those turn on what we get in the negotiation. So how much return on our investment as a state we get will really hinge a lot on what, what that negotiation looks like, I think. Absolutely, maybe, yeah. Maybe stating the obvious. Um, I guess I'm starting to get stressed about that as I'm sure you are. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for bearing with us all afternoon here. Um, you're really patient with us and I appreciate it a lot. No, I'm happy to be here and I'm, you know, open door for questions. So thank you for taking the time. Um, I'll open it up to um, public comment via the raise the hand function. And Owen, I just want to say that I would like to go into executive session if we think we can save a few minutes for that. Yeah, but I, I think it's I appropriate to, to do that yeah, after so, public comment. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to keep people waiting who have been patient. Uh, Ms. Wasserman, hey, how are you? Julie, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm sorry. I just had to click on my camera and my mic. Thank you so much. Um, boy, long day. Lots to, lots to absorb here. And um, I have a number of comments I'd like to contribute. Uh, as you know, I already submitted a, a critique of the AHEAD model. Um, to it to you, and it went to the Agency of Human Services as well as the governor's office. Um, in that critique, I propose that we forego the AHEAD model. Uh, why? Uh, because it does not address Vermont's most pressing problems. And in my view, it will distract us 
from doing so. Uh, and ahead does not address our dwindling supply of primary care physicians. Um, people can't find a primary care physician. And um, I, it doesn't even, even acknowledge that or address that. I suggest that you look at Pat's last slide uh, on primary care, what the Green Mountain Care Board's Primary Care Advisory Committee says, that, you know, there's 14 or 15 items. I suggest you look at that slide and check off the items on that slide where AHEAD will actually address the issue. Um, AHEAD does not address affordability, it, it does not address access, and it does not address wait times as have been addressed, people have mentioned those today. Um, AHEAD does not address the critical lack of funding for mental health and substance use services. Um, and AHEAD also mistakenly focuses on fee-for-service and volume when the actual problem appears to be hospital prices. Uh, I, many people are concerned about AHEAD's global budgets uh, locking in current and historical hospital spending. Uh, and it, it denies Vermont the opportunity to address arbitrary hospital prices, uh, reference-based pricing, um, extraneous hospital costs, and unnecessary ER utilization. And all of those areas are areas for potential savings. And those are off the table once we go with AHEAD's global budgets. Um, and also under AHEAD's global budgets, hospitals could potentially withhold expensive care for patients who need it most. Uh, the AHEAD model will dramatically increase administrative costs and complexity, something that we should be working to do the opposite. It's a very complex, convoluted model, and um, it, it, it will uh, be very uh, expensive, as uh, uh, some of you have mentioned. Um, regarding AHEAD's primary care investments, I'd like to suggest that the $17 million that has been um, discussed today uh, needs a thorough analysis. And, um, you know, is the $9 million from Medicare for blueprint in or out? We need to know that sooner rather than later. We don't, I don't think we would want to wait until negotiations. That's, that's a pretty important piece. Um, a third of Medicare enrollees in Vermont are in Medicare Advantage, so they're not even a part of that. Um, I don't know if they were included in or not in the $17 million. Um, Another point is that hospitals are saying that they are not interested in participating in the AHEAD model unless AHS oversees their budgets. So if that's the case um, and the Green Mountain Care Board continues to be the regulatory, have its regulatory authorities over hospitals, um, uh, and also hospitals own the majority of primary care physicians, there could be a pretty low participation of uh, primary care physicians for that uh, $17 PMPM. So the, my point is that there's a lot of variables here and that um, I think it's dangerous to throw around the 17 million until we have a careful analysis of that, um, of that figure. Um, in addition, uh, we know that um, it, given the majority of Vermont's primary care physicians are um, work for hospitals, what guarantee do we have that those investments won't go to the hospital's bottom line? Now, the same thing happened with OneCare uh, and their primary care investments in 2023, 2024, and also in prior years. As we all know, there's a a pending uh, legal action, uh, but we still don't know if that roughly, I don't know, 20 plus million dollars uh, directly supported primary care as it was intended, or did it bolster hospital revenues? Um, most importantly, uh, there is great concern that AHEAD would in some way disenfranchise the Green Mountain Care Board by shifting oversight of hospitals budgets 
to the Agency of Human Services, and also, I might add, the hospitals. Um, uh, we need to clarify where the locus of hospital budget control would be with the AHEAD model before we move much further, because if AHEAD means that the Green Mountain Care Board is disenfranchised and does not oversee hospital budgets, uh, that would be a pretty significant piece of information to have in terms of whether or not we want to go forward. So I suggest that instead of pursuing the head model, Vermont should do uh, a number of things. I think we have a lot of options open to us, and all of them are within our purview. Um, one would be to strengthen and fortify Vermont's primary care physician workforce through aggressive recruitment and retention initiatives. Another would be to pursue initiatives that improve affordability, improve access, and improve equity. Um, I think that we could spend a fair amount of time in Vermont focusing on initiatives that actually reduce the need for hospital care, reduce the need for hospital care. We all know what that is. We all know that increased access to primary care, increased access to mental health services uh, and home health all would help to reduce the need for hospital care. Furthermore, we need to immediately increase funding for mental health and substance use services. A case in point, since August, the Howard Center has closed four programs and they've suspended an, an additional two programs. So six programs in all. Those programs are Center Point, Intensive Family-Based Services, Autism Toddler Community Program, Public Inebriate Program in St. Albans, Act One, and the Bridge Program. Now, is that not a wake-up call? <laughs> I think we have to pay attention to that. And I hope AHS is aware of this because as we all know, they fund the DAs. Um, other ideas for ways we can move forward is to standardize hospital prices through reference-based pricing. It's a proven uh, rate setting method. Um, we can develop initiatives to identify and eliminate avoidable hospital care uh, and unnecessary ER utilization, as I've mentioned. And um, one other idea is hospital capital expansion. It Hospital capital expansion is one of the big drivers of escalating costs. We could think about uh, creating a statewide global budget for hospital capital expansion. So in conclusion, uh, I think we should forego the AHEAD model, which potentially removes hospital budgets from the Green Mountain Care Board, hands them over to AHS, which I'm hearing wants the hospitals to set their own payment methodology. Uh, that's not too reassuring. Um, and also forego, forego the AHEAD model, uh, which will lock Vermont in to an untested model, untested model for nine years, nine years allowing for little to no progress on Vermont's most pressing problems. And it's, appear, it's, it's, it's apparent from today's discussion that um, there has not been enough analyses of what the effects of this model would do. Um, in fact, it's woefully inadequate. And I think in order to move forward, we need some analyses as um, Chair, uh, as Member Holmes suggested. But one of the biggest problems of all of this is that there has been no public process on the AHEAD model. In my mind, it's a bit of a travesty to be locked in to an untested model for nine years without a public process to vet the merits of this initiative. Legislators, legislators have no idea what AHEAD is. The public who we're supposed to be serving has no clue. And, uh, let, and uh, even people in healthcare don't know about this nine year initiative. So I'd like to conclude by saying that we need to initiate a public process with all the affected parties 
um, especially Vermonters, and the AHEAD model needs to be fully vetted in the public arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wasserman. Mr. Flood? Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Chair Foster. Can, can you hear me all right? We can, yes. No? You can? We, we, okay. we can hear you. I am having a little computer problem. If, uh, the connection, if, if the connection's not good, I'll shut off my video. Uh, but I want to add my voice uh, to those that are concerned, very concerned about proceeding with this model. Um, I have to agree with what Member Walsh said earlier, uh, uh, that this model is not tightly aligned with what Vermont really needs. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, this, to me, is just another uh, very complicated, very expensive uh, model that will take up all our time and energy, and we will not get to dealing with the issues that are really need to be dealt with. There's no mention, really, there's no significant mention in all of this of mental health. There's no significant mention of long-term care. There's no significant mention of, of services like whole, home health. And without those services being robust, all the focus on primary care in the world is not going to change our health care system. And uh, I believe it was uh, Member Holmes who pointed this out that it, you know, if if I can refer to effective services, then what have we accomplished? Uh, now the 17, you know, dollars per member per month is very seductive, and in fact, it could be really helpful because it's one of the things that we know primary care needs. We know primary care needs. But we also know from what the doctors tell us that primary care needs a relief from the administrative burden. I see no uh, attention to that in this model. Uh, we know that uh, primary care, as I just said, needs uh, referrals to uh, effective services in the community. I see no uh, addressing of that in this model. There is reference to making referrals, but it doesn't do you any good if there's nobody to refer you to. And I think that probably all of you saw the recent letter from four emergency room doctors uh, who were pointing out just how bad boarding has become in our hospitals because we don't have services to discharge people to. And in fact, we don't have nurses in the, on floors enough to discharge people upstairs. That's how bad our system is getting. And this model is not going to solve those problems. And in fact, what it's going to do is distract us. We, you know, primary care has never been the problem in, in our health care system. Uh, it's never been the issue. The issue, as I think most of you actually know, is hospital costs. I heard earlier about hospital pricing. It's, if we don't, I don't see anything in this model that's actually going to deal with hospital the costs or hospital pricing. Uh, we know how to do it, as, as Julie just mentioned. There are there are techniques we can use to do that. This model doesn't address it, in my opinion. I haven't seen enough evidence to it. And the whole avoidable care problem uh, is not addressed. It doesn't even come up. The word avoidable, the term avoidable care is not mentioned in any of this. Uh, I, I have to comment that I, I appreciate the effort the board made in the past year or so to address hospital costs. Uh, and I find it very ironic that the thank you got for that was a bill in the legislature that was going to teach you to be decorous. Um, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, we are focusing in the wrong area. We know what to do, and we're simply not doing it. Um, so what I would like to ask the framers of this model is for specific measurable outcomes. You know, don't tell me that Medicare is going to give us $17 per uh, member per month. Tell me what we're going to accomplish by that. Let's, let, before you approve this model, I think you should ask them for measurable outcomes. For example, like 
how many more doctors are we going to have in this state and by when? How many more people in the state are going to have access to a primary care physician when they need it and by when? I, I don't see anything like that. How many people in this state are going to have ready access to a highly affordable mental health care? But I don't think you're going to get answers to those questions because I don't think the framers of this model have even thought about it. But we need some kind of measurable outcomes here, uh, or I don't see any reason to, per to pursue this, this model. So <clears throat> I think you can tell, I, I, I really, we're going, this is just another boondoggle. We spent eight, almost eight years now, start to finish on the original all payer model, and we have almost nothing to show for it, in my opinion, nothing. And we're going down the same road again. And so without a whole lot more evidence of accomplishment and a whole lot more uh, explanation of how we're going to solve the real problems Vermonters are facing, I think that this board should say no and not pursue this model. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have one comment in response, and I actually had a question. So one I've heard, obviously, of the interests in having the model regulated differently or not regulated or regulated by someone other than the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, I wouldn't support that. I think it would be a less attractive model if that were the case. I think the regulatory apparatus and structure is really important to make the model work well. So um, to that comment and question, I would I would not support that. Um, and then the question I had, um, reference-based pricing has been brought up a couple of times, more than a couple, a number of times since I've been here at the board. And I have to say it's quite attractive to me. I think there's a lot of fairness and predictability to it. And I guess the question is for either Ms. Garavich or Ms. Jones, in our design of our methodology, could we put in a reference-based pricing component? So some of our hospitals are very high, like 290, 300% of Medicare. Others are quite a bit lower. Could we set targets based on reference-based pricing and incorporate that into our methodology? Um, Did I take this I will. Oh, go ahead, Shirley. Sorry. Yeah, that's in, I, I think there are options to construct a global budget, right? So the issue is we start with the historical and how much adjustments you'd like to make. So that's one decision point. Currently, the way we were envisioning is that we do efficiency measures where we look at how efficient hospital is from their operational cost and then make payment adjustments accordingly to all payers. The issue with reference pricing or any controls on the prices that the rational behavior would dictate that they would try to maximize with higher utilization to maintain the revenue. So that's why an all payer rate setting in Maryland moved to a fixed budget model because A, as they squeezed the prices, they found out that their utilization went up, right? So at the end, that's the balance, but where you start is important. And there are options in incorporating some of those price adjustments if the state would like to go in that direction. So global budget concept is, flexible in a way, right? So we are trying to control both prices and utilization at the same time. You can fix the prices as you start, or you can fix it gradually over time. So there are multiple options under the methodology. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's true. Our problem is more price than utilization. And so if you're saying lowering price gets you more utilization, which I understand, that sounds attractive to me and like a good way to go about it because we want more utilization and but well, obviously you know let me let me finish uh, obviously there's sorry. a balance you don't want to go bonkers and then you're you're not there so how how do you design it such that you lower the price get the utilization you need but then not have it kind of blow out through the roof Right, I think you're right. Like, how do you define what utilization you want, right? So you don't want unnecessary utilization. So you don't want wasted 
services as well. And in the current model, if you just do reference-based pricing, you do not have policy levers uh, to manage that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So then it becomes the current incentives remaining, you squeeze down on one side and it will pop up in another. So there needs to be additional mechanism to orient the system to provide I would say a quality utilization rather than overall utilization increase. And that goes back to still general concepts around global budget and what you measure and where do you want the transformation happening within the hospital sector. Could you pay less for certain utilization above certain thresholds so it like minimizes the attractiveness of Uh, right, that goes beyond Medicare reference pricing, so that is kind of leaning towards more rate setting methodologies where you do determine the rates based on criteria other than the cost of services, right? So one is to cover the cost, and then you may want to say that, you know, we will provide more than cost for services that we deem needed or high quality or high need. Okay, um, is there other public comment? And I I accidentally, I skipped over the healthcare advocate and I apologize. Hi, Chair Foster, this is Charles Becker. I'm here for the healthcare advocate today. We have no comments specific to the presentation. I would just say that we did uh, submit a comment letter to the board and to AHS at the end of January, I didn't see that posted to the Green Mountain Care Board website, so maybe some of the folks here on this call haven't had an opportunity to see our letter. Um, and so perhaps I should email your 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 assistant to see if we could get that added to the to the website. Well, we'll double check on it on our end and we'll reach out if there's an issue. Um, I apologize. Um, we'll make sure we have it up. Thank you. OK, thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks for flagging us. Chair Foster, would you object if I made a couple of comments in response to Ms. Wasserman and Mr. Flood's um, comments? Please. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, one, um, you know, in terms of um, hospital budget review statute, it's very clear about where that responsibility lies. And I um, just want to um, clarify that um, AHS um, does not, um, you know, have interest in hospital budget review. So um, statute seems very clear. I mean, we're interested in the process and the outcomes, but we're not interested in doing it. Um, in terms of primary care access, um, I would, you know, just note that the idea in, uh, I go, totally agree um, that that's critical. And the idea that uh, of, um, you know, the investment in the AHEAD model, both in terms of overall statewide investment in primary care and the additional PM, PM payments um, would be to provide resources that would hopefully um, improve access to primary care. So just wanted to mention that as well. And, you know, agree that um, there, you know, there are other aspects of the system that aren't directly addressed by the AHEAD model, although um, the intent is certainly to um, see um, partnerships and resources with other parts of the system. And just to note, and I think we've covered it a bit today, but that there's, um, you know, this is, a, these are big problems and require um, multifaceted responses. And so, um, you know, AHS is certainly um, focused on Im improving um, so system of care and access to care in the system and so forth. So just wanted to, you know, mention that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I don't see any other public comment. Um, I think I think we can wrap it up. Oh, one more. Um, Kim Fitzgerald, Mrs. Fitzgerald. 
Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'm Kim Fitzgerald, I'm the CEO for Cathedral Square and we're the statewide administrators of SASH. And so I just wanted to just make a comment that I, I really appreciate Pat's representation of the concern for SASH if um, we don't move forward. And I appreciate the mem board members bringing up, you know, contingency planning um, if, if we don't move forward um, with a head because we have not heard of any other um, funding mechanism for SASH moving forward outside of a head. So I just want to appreciate the effort and energies you're putting towards to considering that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your work there. Um, we were able to visit, uh, was it October or so? And it's really, not, really lovely. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, great. Um, Ms. Jones, thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Um, long meeting, and thanks for your patience. So, Owen, Thank if you. I could jump in, I don't know if people have time or appetite for oh, executive right. session at this point of the day. Um, so maybe we, I can bring that up in old business uh, next week. If it would be nice if Pat and Shule were there because I think they could provide some uh, important uh, additional information. Um, so I won't move that today, but I will just say a couple of things I've been holding off on saying, um, trying to make sure everybody else had time to talk. So uh, I think one, one thing that I just wanna maybe provide some reassurance on is CMMI does not have the authority to change the state's regulatory process. That is purely a state law issue. Um, so I don't think, that that is a possibility under the AHEAD model. In the discussion today, I heard a lot of conflation between commercial price issues and uh, Medicare issues, because I don't think that the, the issues are the same across every payer. And so I think as we continue to refine our discussion, we should be thinking about Medicare, and we have to think about the whole thing, but we also have to think about the payer specific issues. And I think with Medicare, as we um, have, we talk about a lot, the, the state compared to other state tends to be low cost. And so a risk there in the AHEAD model is we need to make sure that our total cost of care negotiation results in um, a reasonable Medicare total cost of care. To me, that's the most essential component to this. And that's something that's difficult to talk about in the public session because it it is so heavily negotiated. So that's part of my anxiety about wanting to do the executive session because I think I want to talk about that with others. Um, and I think to the points that others have made, like in commercial, the issue has been price. And so when you're thinking about, and in terms of the commercial design, like that is not a CMMI issue, that is a state issue. So we have a lot of opportunity to think through what makes sense for the state there. Understanding of course, that will drive providers crazy if there's not reasonably aligned incentives. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that given the hour, um, but I hope that we will be able to go into, oh, we don't have a meeting next week, so it wouldn't be next week, but I hope that we will be able to talk about the Medicare total cost of care considerations um, because I do think that for me is the key component um, post negotiation that will need to be evaluated. And I'd love to share some thoughts about that. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe what it will make sense for us to do is actually just dedicate a full board hearing to executive session or something so people don't have to wait around for us to go in. And, you know, it's so it's off putting to me. I can only imagine what it's like to be trying to participate. And I did just want to give a nod to the public comment and the effort that people put in to, to critique and, and provide feedback. It is so massively valuable, right? I've said this for a long time since I've been at the board, really. Sometimes it's like the best thoughts and ideas are from my other board members, staff, guests, but also the public. So this is your own time as far as I understand it. And so thank you for doing it to try and help us make this as beneficial as we can or to make Make sure we make the right decisions. So th thanks everyone for sticking around and, and doing that for us because it's really valuable public service. Um, all right. Uh, any old business or new business other than Ms. Lunges? Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn?
I'll move to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> All, right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.